got we got people in Alex yeah it looks like we have 20 and it's um it hasn't gone up in a few seconds okay. so okay it should be good to start um all right good afternoon good evening everybody my name is Jay Claypool I'm going to chair tonight's uh, meeting of the board of architects review small uh with me are three board members uh, Glenn Gardner Julia Martin and Fillmore Wilson City staff present is our administrator, Kim Lavin, uh, and senior planner, uh, Alex Howe. The order of the meeting uh, is gonna be as follows. Um, staff will give a very brief introduction to the project, at which time the applicant uh, may present, if that's um, the applicant, anyone speaking on behalf of the applicant, uh, and there's a 10 minute window, and uh, we've been sort of keeping an eye on that uh, in recent meetings. Uh, a reminder to everyone uh, who's speaking to please state your name clearly for the record. Uh, the applicant's presentation period will conclude, uh, public comment period will open, and uh, that will last for 10 minutes. Uh, again, anyone making a public comment, please state your name clearly for the record. Uh, we'll then hear from staff as to its comments on the project uh, and its recommendation. Uh, after that, uh, the applicant can respond and clarify uh, anything that's been brought up uh, at staff and or public comment. And again, that's that's clarification, that's um, sort of response, that's not sort of launching right back into the application. That's that's what that period of time is intended for. So uh, at that point in time, the floor closes, the board will deliberate and uh, ultimately vote. The board may ask questions, uh, the applicant, staff, anybody uh, at any time, and we, we generally begin doing that right on the heels of the applicant's presentation. There's been two agenda items that were originally published, uh, agenda item one, 248 Grove, and agenda item two, 51 point set. Uh, neither of those are gonna be heard tonight. We'll take them up later. And uh, lastly, please remind your, uh, myself to turn off your cell phone and limit your comments to architecture. Um, we have some virtual meeting protocols that Kim will get over briefly, and then we'll get going. Thank you, Jay. Staff will control the PowerPoint presentation that includes everything submitted by the applicant by the deadline in accordance with the submittal requirements. Applicants simply need to ask staff to advance to the next slide during your presentation. Applicants, staff, and board members are required to give their name whenever speaking. Video and microphone has been disabled for all attendees. Attendees, not board or staff, will only be given capabilities to speak when they're called on during public comment period. Chat and the Q&A functions have been disabled for everyone. For public comment, the applicants and all team members and the public who've been re required to register indicate the project they wish to comment on and submit any documents in advance of the meeting. Just as in in-person meetings, all applications heard today are part of a public meeting format. If you've registered and will speak during the public comment portion of the meeting, you'll need to state your name and address for the record. Those members of the public that have registered will be called in order by project. Members of the public that speak are encouraged to remain in the meeting for the completion of any item they've commented on. Staff will call on the registered members of the public to speak for each project. Unregistered members of the public who raise their hand will not be called on. The board, board members will be polled by the chair for comments and for their vote on a motion. Each member when voting should respond yay in favor or nay, not in favor. The chairman shall reread the motion verbatim and the board member making the motion should correct the chairman if he has not reread the motion accurately. If a board member needs to recuse, he'll be temporarily removed from the meeting and placed back in the meeting at the start of the next agenda item. If the board needs to go into executive session, they will call into a separate meeting conference line and all video and audio Zoom on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they're ready to return to the regular meeting. Staff will issue meeting results, including staff comments and board motion to the applicant following the meeting. Results will also be posted on the city website, www.charleston-sc.gov slash BAR. And the uh, additional information can be found at BAR at charleston slash sc.gov or on the same website if you're having technical difficulties during the meeting. And these proceedings are being recorded. Thank you. Okay, great. I think the first gen item 
Yep, next one. Uh, nine, Nats Court. Nine, Nats Court is requesting approval for complete demolition. The building isn't rated in the West Side neighborhood circa pre-1944. Um, that should be corrected to pre-1902 in the historic materials demolition purview. Here's a little bit of context for you. Um, in the middle of the block, um, north of Noonan, Ashley, Fishburn, and Rutledge Avenue, just north of the Crosstown. The 1944 Sanborn map. And if the applicant is here, take it away from here. There we go. Hello, uh, my name is Luke Jarrett. I'm the applicant. We're, we are the architect representing the owner of Nine Nats Court for this request. Um, if we could please advance the slide to, um, I'm sorry, I, I, there we go. I'm gonna get my screen set back up. May we have slide number uh, seven, please? Is that right? Uh, let's see, one before that, I apologize, was that, yeah. It's the streetscape. Streetscape? Yeah. Sorry? A005, there we go. This is probably a good one to start from. Okay, uh, my name is Luke Jarrett, as I mentioned, we're with Synchronicity. Um, we were hired by the client uh, who owns the parcel to uh, investigate this existing structure and come up with you know some op options for what, what could be done with the building. Um, our initial effort uh, started with research for the, for the structure. Uh, as you've demonstrated, the building shows up around 1944, before 1944 in the Sanborn maps. Uh, the site um, was populated with a different structure earlier on. Uh, so somewhere in between 05 and 44, uh, the structure that's currently there uh, appeared on the site. Um, one of the interesting things that we determined was uh, based on the orientation of this structure, uh, which is a modified Freedman's Cottage uh, with the piazza on the, um, sorry, the east side of the building, um, it, is, it is evident that this building was not constructed in the location that it is currently today, um, that the piazzas would, would have been constructed the south or the west side of a, a Freedman's Cottage or a Charleston single. Um, so um, that coupled with some other uh, observations that we made during our site visits, um, related to the, um, the remnants of foundation that the building is resting on currently, uh, that they're not brick uh, and, and mortar as they would have been originally. They, they sit on uh, some CMU uh, piers uh, that, that are more modern construction. Um, those items all combine to indicate that the structure is, that is present is not original to the site. So it was moved some, from somewhere else to this site. Um, as we got uh, a little further into our um, investigation, uh, we conducted a field assessment surveys and, and drew the building up. If we could please advance to um, A001, which I believe should be slide 11. There we go. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a floor plan that we were able to create, uh, you know, going inside of the structure and, and looking around. Um, there's a substantial failure of the um, sorry, the western side of the structure um, and a, a good deal of, of the building is entirely missing along that wall. Um, floor areas uh, where there is nothing at all. There's uh, the, the majority of the flooring in here is uh, there's some, some flooring left rotted with the, with the joisters too. Um, there's only a, a very minimal area where, this, where it's even safe to walk um, along the bottom of the structure. Um, we also have seen at the piazza um, it's indicated that the piazza that's there today is also not the original piazza of the structure. Um, the columns, the second and third columns to the right of this piazza do not rest on the beam that sits under the porch. They actually sit back further into the um, piazza itself. And also the decking of the piazza is a pretty wide range of materials um, with a heavy percentage of more contemporary uh, uh, tongue and groove um, flooring. Uh, so um, if, if we could please move the next to the next slide forward. Um, and, and sorry, advance it two more slides to A203. 
Thank you. Uh, if this is the elevation that's showing that piazza, we, we can also see um, that the columns that are there do not line up with the four uh, little corbel elements that are the remnants of those along the fascia. Um, again, further indicating that this is not the original piazza. Um, the roof of the structure is a modern 5V uh, barn style unpainted roof. Uh, it's not the original roof finish and it is failed largely, not suitable for reuse. Uh, exterior cladding of the building is uh, lap siding. Uh, there's a wide range of, uh, not a wide, there's a handful of different um, types of siding areas and ages. You can see where the you know, members have been scabbed in uh, and replaced. Um, the exterior cladding is in, in a, a pretty bad state of disrepair. The building, uh, its primary problem is its roof has failed uh, drastically and also the foundations um, have failed so that a substantial portion of the building is in contact with the wet soil. Uh, and over the years that, that it's been like that, the moisture content in all of these, all the wood in this building is extremely high. Uh, the wood is wet everywhere. Uh, there's extensive termite mold, uh, rot uh, damage. Um, so um, I guess that's the short version of sort of the status of the structure. Um, if we could please, let's see what the best slide to move to next would be. Um, if we could uh, move to slide, um, Number five, please, that's A003. So um, we know that this building right now um, is in a state of repair that would require any improvement to be done to this structure to be classified as a substantial improvement, which is greater than 50% of the value of the structure. Uh, a, state, a substantial improvement also triggers uh, the requirement of modern FEMA and also modern building codes to come into play. Um, when we were looking at the potential of trying to repair, rehabilitate the structure um, based on the extent of the damages and the fact that we would be complying with code, we would not be able to reuse any of the original wood framing members, uh, even if there were one or two in there that looked like it could be sufficient uh, for reuse. We, they would not pass a modern framing inspection um, for 2018 SCBC. Um, and that's even assuming that we could find one that would be we would ask to reuse there, there's none, it's, it's very bad. Um, the cladding is in the same condition. The, the areas that, that appear to be the original cladding are in terrible shape, would not survive removal, um, certainly couldn't be reused um, because of their deterioration. Um, really, uh, you know, when we're looking at the structure, the only option here would be a total ground up reconstruction of this building. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of one point we sort of take a look at um, you know, you realize there's not historic fabric here uh, of significant importance. Anything that would happen would be effectively new. Uh, and also the, sub the substantial improvement clause would, for FEMA would cause us to elevate the building about uh, six, six and a half feet above flood. Uh, you can see a dashed line in the elevation that's on your screen right now, um, you know, that would show where the finished floor would be. So not only would we not be able to reuse any of the original materials of this structure, uh, we would also have to completely obliterate its, its um, historic massing. Uh, so it would have really no character or context that would even um, re remain. And these are requirements that, that we're not able to get around. Um, we reached out to uh, the South Carolina Historic Preservation Office to check on the status of this building for its applicability for a historic structures variance. Um, unfortunately, we do not fall in any of the areas um, that would allow us to do that. We are outside of National Historic Register areas uh, on this site. And this building is not listed as an individual structure. Uh, so there is no opportunity to get a historic structures variance for this building, which would allow us to at least keep it you know, to its original massing. Um, with all this information in hand, and then again, if we could return to the slide A005 that demonstrates the streetscape. Um, Thank you. Uh, with all this information in hand and, and also as a fact that the structure is pretty minimally visible from the public right of way, um, it is not contributing to the Noonan streetscape uh, in any meaningful way. Um, and, um, and there's just really, there's not really any way that we can do anything with this building that would retain any of its original character or massing or materials. Um, it, it, it's really, um, you know, the point where we would 
we, we thought that the demolition was really the only res respectful and reasonable option for this particular structure based specifically on those very specific conditions. Um, this is not something that we approach lightly. We do not, we do, not do this. We do not, do not like to ask for demolitions. Um, in this case, however, uh, there just is not another course of action that's realistic for this structure, which is very unfortunate. So we are requesting demolition. Um, we have presented this project to, to the West Side Neighborhood Association meeting at the previous meeting uh, with the same presentation and gone through that. At the end of that meeting, they uh, conducted a vote and elected to unanimously support our request. Um, and so um, we are asking the board to consider the project for demolition. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, board questions at this point? No. Um, okay, well, any public comment? We have two members of the public speaking. Uh, we'll go to Julie O'Connor first. Thank you. Um, Julie O'Connor with SOS Charleston. We want to thank the applicant for taking the time to discuss the project at the site visit this morning. It was certainly enlightening, although heartbreaking. This house was built sometime between 1897 and 1902. Um, two parcels were subdivided into five lots that ran north-south in 1920. A house identical to this one is on the 1902 Sanborn maps and the lots were oriented east-west at that time. It is our assumption that the house was bridging two of the new lots and was therefore rotated to its current location. This would explain the unusual orientation of the piazza. If the building was constructed in the mid 20th century, there would have been a building permit as the city has permit records dating back to 1932. It is clear that the historic fabric that remains on the building is almost completely destroyed and not salvageable due to the length of time it was allowed to deteriorate. We beg the city to rewrite the demolition by neglect ordinance to better protect these structures and increase funding for the BAR to hire an enforcement officer to catch these cases well before they get to this point. We ask that the city prioritize the reestablishment of the de demolition by neglect task force and implement meaningful reform when it comes to protecting our historic resources. If we do not take action now, the BAR will be seeing at least one application like this every meeting. With every demolition, we lose a piece of our history and of the story of Charleston and its people. Thank you. Our next member of the public speaking is April Wood. April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. Uh, good comments by Ms. O'Connor, we agree. Um, historic Charleston Foundation has reviewed the request for the complete demolition of the historic building at Nine Nats Court. We appreciate that the applicant has reached out to HCF about this project. We are sorry to see the structure in the neglected condition that it is in today. This building contributes to the historic character of the neighborhood and is the, the last remnant of it, the historic court. With effort, hopefully it could successfully be rehabilitated. It is therefore important that this historic structure is retained. We recommend denial of the application. Thank you. Okay, Alex, no more public comment, right? No more public comment. Okay, so how about staff comments and recommendation? Kim, you're muted. While BAR staff re rarely recommend approval for the demolition of a historic structure, it's clear that this building is unsalvageable. So the BAR staff is recommending approval for demolition. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, Luke, anything in response to public or staff comment? No, uh, we're grateful for the feedback, um, especially from uh, Julie. Um, and yeah, we concur with everybody. It's unfortunate that this building is beyond any sort of repairs. That's all we have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, let's go to board discussion. Um, uh, maybe I'll start at the top here and call on Glenn just to get us going and um, we'll, we'll fall in line here. Sure. Um, I, I am of the same mindset, I, I think, as both of the public comments. It, it certainly is unfortunate um, but in looking at, at the documentation of this, 
I, I don't really see what is left that could be salvaged, especially if they, um, they've obviously done their, their homework and they do not fall within um, an allowable area um, with regard to um, the, the ordinance. I would, I, would, uh, I would be in favor of demolition in this unique circumstance. Um, I'm pretty much there as well. Uh, I appreciate the public comments, especially that advocacy for additional city staff in the preservation department, which is absolutely critical. Um, and you know, it sounds like the current owner has had this property for a little while, but I think I, it's evident that it was um, that it's been in this condition for for longer than that. So I concur with staff and um, I can go ahead and make a motion for approval of this demolition request. Um, unless anybody else wants to comment, that sounds fine. Bill Moore, do you have any dissent to that? Uh, you know, I agree with um, uh, Glenn, with you and, and Julia and with staff. Uh, you know, there's nothing here to say but the form and that's really not quite possible in this circumstance. So I'm in agreement. Okay. I'll, Glenn Gardner, I'll second Julia's motion. All right, I'll call the vote. Um, Glenn? Yay in favor. Julia? Yay in favor. Bill Moore? Yay in favor. All right, Chair votes yay in favor. Mass motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, okay, next gen item is 61 Reed House A. Sixty one Reed Street is requesting conceptual approval for a new construction of a duplex at the front of the lot. This is an east side neighborhood in the old city district. Just a little context for you. The large lot. Here's some existing site photos. Current building. This is looking east on Reed Street. This looks west on Reed Street. And the previous motion on September 10th, 2020 was deferral with staff comments regarding House A, two through five, and staff comments regarding House B, two and three. Board condition to require site section and clarification of subordination of House B to House A. Some of the board comments were proportions of the front house have improved, the depth of that bay will look odd when constructed, design direction of back house much improved, rethink powder bathroom and master suite layout, so front elevation is fenestration. Building A, some simplification of style of the house. Um, another building B has progressed nicely. S site section would really help pin down the relationship of the two houses. And another comment was almost in agreement of fellow board members. I think front house is getting very close. A is going to read really odd. Simplification needed, reduction of ceiling heights to reduce mass some degree about having a site section to help clarify. And with that, if the applicant wants to take it from here. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yep. Good evening. Um, so everyone has seen this before. We can probably run through the overall site condition uh, slides if you want to. Um, move through the existing conditions and the, we got, got approval for demolition previously. Um, you can keep moving. Um, so the location of house, the two houses on site, this is a submission for house A. Next slide. Uh, existing site and zoning conditions. Previous Sanborn map showing the house locations. Uh, existing site photos of the street along Reed Street. And then also uh, from Nassau Street where you can have um, possible potential slight views into the lot and also from uh, Nassau Street. 
and some South Street on the south. So this is only for House A submission. Um, next okay. slide. This is the original uh, proposed floor plan. And then the next would be the previous proposed floor plan. And then the current proposed first floor plan, taking out the bay window on the front. Um, same thing for the next three slides, the second floor. Um, not a drastic change from the previous submittal. Uh, and the same for the roof plans. And so we should be getting up to, yeah, these are the two previously proposed elevations, one on the left being the initial one, the one on the right being the previous one. Uh, and then the next slide shows the current proposed. Um, and I want to take a moment actually to break from this um, and just uh, read uh, just the timeline from this project and along with a few experts from the zoning ordinance as it pertains to the powers and duties of the architectural review board. This is for documentation purposes of these projects. The response from the city staff and the board is not requested. Um, the timeline of meetings and documents submitted to the review for 61 Reed Street. Uh, March 4th, 2020, met with Lee Batchelder at the city zoning department. Determined that a two house layout would be a better fit for the site versus a three house layout. Decided to proceed in that direction with zoning department support. First submittal to BAR was April 13th, 2020, for demolition in both proposed house designs. The BAR pre presentation was postponed due to the pandemic until June 25th meeting. It was pulled from the agenda for non-compliance of the title page and clear identification of exterior material, although material identification was on the drawings. June 25th, 2020 received BAR staff approval for the demolition of the existing building. Second submitted the BAR July 4th, 2020 for both houses. Next two BAR small meeting agendas were full. The next meeting date given was August 13th. Uh, BAR presentation on August 13th uh, house A was deferred for massing. House D was denied per staff comments. The third submittal to BAR was August 31st, 2020 for both proposed house designs. The BAR presentation on September 10th. House A and B were deferred for massing. The fourth submittal to BAR on October 2nd, 2020 for both proposed house designs. The BAR presentation the submittal was Pulled from the agenda, notice given to applicant four hours before the meeting. The fifth submittal to the BAR, October 19th, 2020, for both proposed tax designs. Uh, this is currently our fifth submittal for conceptual review. The overall height of the house has been reduced by one foot two inches for House A from the original submission. Per staff and board comments, the overall height for the House um, has been reduced by three feet, eight and a half inches for House B from the original submission, first staff and board comments, and uh, one foot from the last submission. The general architectural direction has been adjusted for staff, board, and public comments for both House A and B. We are currently six months and 16 days since the original submission to the BAR. Outside of demolition approval, there have been no other approvals granted by the BAR. And then this is um, the from the City of Charleston Zoning Ordinance, Section 54-240, Board of Architecture Review Powers and Duties, uh, Paragraph D states that among other grounds for considering design inappropriate and requiring denial or deferral and resubmission are the following effects, arresting and spectacular effects, violent contrast in material color and intense and lurid colors, multiplicity of incongruity of details resulting in a restless and disturbing appearance, the absence of unity, visual compatibility and coherence in composition form and proportion not in con consonance with the dignity and character of the present structure in the case of repair, remodeling and enlargement of an existing structure, or with the prevailing character of the immediate surroundings in the case of a new structure. Paragraph E states, in case of denial of an application, the Board of Architectural Review shall state the reasons therefore in a written statement to the applicant and make recommendations in regards to appropriateness of design. So, on to the current submission. 
we've taken the design of the historic house for house A, simplified it per recommendation by the board and the staff and um, public comment. Um, we've also reduced the scale um, based on the recommendations from city staff and, and board. This is the elevation facing three streets. Um, if you want to move to the next sheet, these again, the um, other two elevations, both the original proposed elevation on the left and the previous proposed on the right. And then the next sheet shows uh, the current proposed uh, with simplified detailing um, with and similar materials. Uh, next page, uh, the previous streetscape, um, both north and south, or the original one. The next one will show the previous one and then our current um, one as it relates to the height scale mass from the previous. Uh, and then I think the last page is a site section looking both directions uh, it, and how the buildings uh, relate to each other. I believe that's it. Okay, uh, thanks, Kevin. So, any questions from the board right now? No. No. Okay. So, uh, is there any public comment? I have one member of the public speaking. We'll go to Anna Catherine Carroll. Thank you, Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society of Charleston. First, we do feel the architecture is moving in the right direction and we appreciate the simplification of details. However, we generally still think the design deserves another pass to be more aligned with the contemporary direction of House B at the rear, which we feel more appropriate, appropriately reads of its time. Two specific items we will point out are the lower windows on the front facade are underscaled and should be taller and the side lights on the west elevation doors are unsuccessful and should be removed. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Alex, if there's no other live comment, uh, we got a letter. Um, uh, staff, y'all have shared it with the whole board. It contains some pictures that are referenced in the letter. I'll read it. Um, it's from the owner of 22 Massaw, the, the property that runs essentially perpendicular to 61 Reed that was purchased recently by Christopher Damata. Uh, his concern relates to the trees on the lot. One the one demarcated as a 10 foot elm is shared by my property and our fence is built around it as viewed in the picture attached to this email. I want to ensure that the tree would not be removed. Also, I also want to know what the plans would be for the 10 foot devil wood and the 13 foot hack. Will they be removed or not? Uh, also including a picture of the view of the trees and that part of the lot that would be where house B is located. As you can see, there's not, there's quite a large tree there. Perhaps it is the one noted as damaged on the drawings. Currently, this tree is providing a home for bats, which we see regularly at dusk. I want everyone to be aware of this and to note how the demolition of the tree would disrupt parts of the current ecological system. Uh, would the undamaged 25 foot oak tree remain on the lot? Uh, Nicole Sussman is the uh, writer. Um, Alex, no other public comments? No other public comment. Okay. Um, Kevin, oh, so let's go to staff. Staff comments and recommendations. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Uh, we have, have a couple comments. Massing and proportions are out of scale with the context of the streetscape. Previous comment to restudy fenestration was not addressed and the fenestration remains unbalanced. Windows are ill-proportioned and do not meet egress. There appears to be room in the program to reduce the width and increase the window size to better conform to the streetscape. Provide details of how house will transition to sidewalk. Restudy transom hood detail over entry door. The piazza roof under cornice of main excuse me, tie piazza roof under cornice of main roof instead of concurrent to eliminate side lights on rear door on the west elevation. The windows visible to the public right away should be double hung. Eliminate single, sh single sash on west elevation. Provide shutters for east and west elevations. South elevation is optional as it's not visible to the public right away. Uh, and follow submittal guidelines for final review submission. 
and meet with the staff if, if necessary. Um, we, we don't really want to defer this um, application again. I feel like this, these comments um, and working together, we can, we can move on um, at the staff level. So we want to give conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Thank you. All right, um, thanks, Kim. Um, Kevin, is there any response to public comment or to staff comments? Um, yeah, just quickly appreciate uh, city staff meeting and, and talking about this project. Um, I believe as well that we can work through these, these issues um, and others that the board might uh, have a conversation about. Uh, and happy to meet the, the neighbor on site or to discuss um, trees. I, I, I don't have those pictures in front of me or which trees he's referring to. So, um, but, but open to having a discussion and a meeting about those. Okay, um, so let's do this. Let's go to board discussion. Maybe Alex, just as an aside, if you could share the pictures with Kevin, uh, then, then he can take that up on his own and, and we'll focus on our purview, which is the architecture. And um, so does anybody want to kick us off? Maybe I'll point to Julia, see if we can get going. Sure. Um, I would like to start with a quick question for staff about comment number one. Oh, are you still there, Kim? Yep. Um, the are you is that just a comment? Are you are you hoping that that is trying to achieve something? Um, you know what I'm saying? It seems like a yeah. substantial comment, but um, I do. I do. Observation. Building needs to be um, needs to come in a little bit somehow. Um, throughout this process, the building got three feet wider, and I'm assuming we talked about it, but. Um, between, I think, second and third iterations. Hmm. And now that um, it's brought down to a subordinate height and context with the rest of the neighborhood, it's just too wide. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I feel like staff has done a good job of enumerating some key refinements uh, that can be made as you move forward and that I would agree with staff that that the applicant and staff can work these out. Um, but they're really important points that staff's brought up. You know, for example, the window proportion is just, I mean, it's just a little bit off still if, if, what, if the goal is traditional design, which I understand it is for this front house. So um, I'm totally comfortable letting staff and the applicant work these things out, but I'm not discounting the importance of what staff's asking for. And I, I just wanna address the portion of the applicant's presentation that pertains to the timeline and the board's purview. You know, everybody's dealing with the inconveniences and delays caused by the pandemic. So we're not really responsible for that. But otherwise, I mean, it really seems to me like these two applications have been handled kind of by the book, just as I would have expected them to. I mean, they're about the first application or two, we're missing that site section, which, you know, technically, I think should have taken it off the agenda um, from the start. So I really, I, you know, I, I feel for the applicant. I know it's been a long process and kind of grueling, but I, I just would like to assure him that there's nothing unusual or, you know, um, pointed toward him or his projects that have affected the process as, as I see it. So luckily we're kind of at the end of this now. And, um, you know, I think if you work through those points that staff's brought up, I think you, you'll be good to go. Anybody else want to tack on? We got two, two thoughts if nobody else has anything else. I, uh, Julia, I'll just add, uh, it, I, I thought it was a little unusual sort of with this type and um, maybe nebulousness of the comments to recommend conceptual approval and then final review by staff. I, I, I hear Kim loud and clear that um, and you that we're comfortable with that. Um, but just to, you know, to your point about trying to work with the applicant and understand that, I, uh, to me, that's a, that's, a, that's a big deal for us to do something like that, to take a step like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so I understand why, and, and so I'm willing to do it, but oh. I just wanted to tack that on. 
Yeah, you know, I, I take your point. I do. And I don't know really what the disadvantage would necessarily be of, of us seeing it back as a as a final design, you know, because it's a lot to put on staff's plate for them to work through all of that. I'll, yeah. I, yeah, I wasn't necessarily advocating for it. I mean, if that's what y'all want, I'll, I'll hear you out. That's fine. I just wanted to make the point that you're right. We're 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 doing our part, and then some to try to uh, mm -hmm. assist this process, and that's that's sort of a big step we're taking right here. You're correct about that. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I agree with all that. I don't think any of it necessarily needs repeating. I, I think staff's comments are pretty much. Uh, spot on. And I mean, frankly, we're all design professionals or most of us on the board are, and we're all waiting our turn in line. And I have things that aren't approved either. So it's a matter of being patient. And, um, you know, it, it happens as quickly as our staff is able to make it happen. Glenn, can I ask what your um, inclination is regarding seeing it back or? I mean, I, I was surprised when I got to the bottom of the staff comments and, and it said, um, to go to staff for final approval, but at the same time, I mean, I, I do, there are a couple of key things here um, that I think need to be addressed. I guess at the same time, um, I do trust our staff to, um, to review it and um, approve or disapprove of it uh, internally. I don't know if that would help uh, the applicant go any faster based on staff's workload or not. Um, it might actually help them along the way for the board to, to see it back, but I, I frankly can be comfortable either way uh, because I think that the comments from staff are, you know, are well pointed and if those are all addressed, I think it would be able to be approved at staff level. Yeah. I mean, I think the comments are good, but they're, you know, there's some pretty substantial ones there, which is why I asked about number one, you know, massing and proportions. Right. That's, a, that's big. And if we think about all the applications that we see, I think it would be a real outlier, like Jay is saying, for for us to, to do conceptual approval with final review by staff at this level of resolution. So, um, uh, Fillmore, do you want to weigh in? I agree with with all the comments that have been made and and uh, Glenn, uh, particularly that I had the same um, reaction you did after I read through the comments and saw that it was it was conceptual approval with final review by staff. I was surprised um, at that. Um, uh, there's a lot in the comments. I think that the comments are on point. I do think the design has come a long way, and I think uh, a number of the issues have been addressed, but certainly not all of them. And so uh, I am uh, a little up in the air about, um, I have a lot of confidence that staff can, uh, uh, if they're willing to do it, that staff uh, can do final review by staff. I'm, I'm also perfectly willing to see it back final. Well, maybe Kim, I'll ask maybe a rhetorical question, but I'm, I'm guessing staff wouldn't have recommended final review by staff if staff wasn't comfortable making that call. So I'm, I'm willing to give, because I think they've asked for it and I think they're capable of doing it. I'm willing to give them uh, the opportunity. And, and we've seen the off ramp on this. If, if, if staff and the applicant can't figure out the final details, it just comes back to the board. Um, and so I would imagine that's what would happen here. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt. It seems like staff you know, thinks it, it can work, um, but that, that's my two cents. <clears throat> Anybody sort of strong opinions the other way? I guess the only question to that, Jay, you know, it, it, when, when staff comment one, as has already been mentioned, says the massing and proportions are out of scale with the context of the streetscape, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain how easy that box is or is not to check. But um, I, I, I can frankly go either way on this, depending on what the majority of fellow board members feel. Um, I'm gonna throw, just throw a um, motion out there 
for conceptual approval with staff comments. Okay. Is there a second to Julia's motion? Uh, no more. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, I'll put it to a vote. So, um, Julia. Yay in favor. Fillmore. Yay in favor. Glenn. Yay in favor. Okay. I'll vote too. Yay in favor. Um, so it passes unanimously. All right. So let's go to House B, 61 Reed. All right. 61 Reed Street is requesting conceptual approval for the new construction of a single family house at the rear of the lot. Same applies, east side, old city district. Here's the aerial image. Previous motion was for deferral with staff comments regarding house B, e, two and three. Board conditioned to require a site section and clarification of the subordination it was on September 10th. Um, I've already read through these. And if you want to take it from here. Thanks, Kim. Um, if you don't mind just jumping to the uh, site plan, uh, the next site plan outlining House B. Uh, we don't have to go through all the context pictures um, that we just went through just to help expedite the process. So, um, sorry, Kevin, where do you want me to be? Um, yeah, this is fine. Um, <laughs> essentially, the, the floor plan has changed very little. You can actually go to the, the front, the elevation pages, 200. Um, yeah, so the previous one shows the initial submittal on the left and the previous submittal on the right. Um, in that submittal, we reduced the roof line uh, two feet, eight um, inches and in, in change. Uh, next sheet, please. And so in this submittal, we reduced the, the massing of the house another foot, as well as um, added a window on the front tower element that, that faces the street on the ground level to, to provide a little bit more um, symmetry to that mass. Other than that, the detailing is, is um, the same, materials are the same from the previous to middle. Next page. Um, south and east elevation of the, the first two submissions. Uh, next page. And then our current submission um, with very little change uh, here other than I think the location of the front door. Uh, and again, the lowering of the, the roof height uh, from the last one. Uh, and then the last pages show again the, the street elevations um, of the last two submissions and then the current submittal, as well as the site sections showing the relationship of the, the two houses. We do feel like the the back house is subordinate, um, and has always wanted to be subordinate. I know there's this uh, question of how far tucked in it should be because of the the way that the lot is configured and the depth of the lot, as well as the vegetation on the site. Um, you know, the the idea of this thing extending to the east slightly past the the plane of the front house. Um, in our opinion, it still makes it a, a subordinate in nature and, and not um, and 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 not in con incongruent with other typologies in in the area or in Charleston. Um, I've had conversations again with staff about this, so I believe that's all. Thank you. Questions. I just have one question for Kevin. Um, I, I don't see it called out, but what is the material of the, like the main volume of the house? What is the cladding? Uh, stucco. And then that's on frame? Yes. And there, I guess there would be control joints and stuff that you'll figure out at some point? We would. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll just have a public comment. No public comment on this one. All right, how about staff comments? Building is subordinate to House A. 
as per BAR guidelines. The drawings require further development and detail, sales, trim, dimensions, et cetera. The windows are quite large, restudy and dimension for further review. Ensure compliance with submittal guidelines. The staff's recommending conceptual approval with staff comments in final review by staff. Okay, um, Kevin, you wanna clarify or respond to anything? No, I'm good, thank you. All right, how about board discussion? You might wanna kick us off. Uh, did you say me? No, yeah. whoever. <laughs> oh, sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't go ahead. Yeah, I mean, no more. Go for it. You, I called uh, on you. Correct. I'll start. I'll start off. Um, I wasn't asleep, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I agree with staff. I mean, there's this, um, uh, this one I think has a, uh, a lot less development uh, in uh, sort of high scale and mass than the in the front house, the the, um, the staff comments obviously pertain uh, to details on the windows. So my one comment is that the drawings really are quite schematic, and uh, but I'm assuming staff can work that out and get the details they need on the drawings. So um, I'm in favor of staff's recommendation. Um, I am as well. I I really like this little design. I think it is clever and um, I like the proportions. I feel like the windows are appropriate. Um, it's just maybe in comparison to the front house, which has unusually tiny windows that it, that it looks odd. But um, I, I do, I like this design. I think that entry that's sort of hidden has the potential to be a really unique and um, enjoyable experience if it's detailed properly. Um, my, and, I am just always scared of stucco on frame. I just, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it is, it works really well or ages well. Um, I mean, in theory, it'd be nice to have a nice uniform, you know, plain finished without any details, but it, that's not really what it is. So that, that does scare me a little bit, but in terms of the overall design, the concepts, um, I think it's, I think it's really nice. And I think it's, fine to be a, a dependency sort of secondary structure on this lot. So I agree with staff. Um, any other comments and while well, anybody's thinking, so Julia, you, you're kind of like agree with staff other than staff three? Yeah, yeah, about the windows. Okay, <clears throat> anything else? Anybody wanna make a motion? Um, all right, I, I might leave comment three about the windows in there only because they might have some residual effect on the front house, if that's okay. So I'm gonna say conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Okay, Julie's made a motion, is there a second? Lynn Gardner, second. Go ahead. Yep. Fillmore, I'm giving that one to Glenn. All right, I'll call the roll. Um, Glenn? In favor. Julia? Yay in favor. Fillmore? Yay in favor. Chair Betts, yay in favor. Motion carries unanimously. Um, next agenda item is number six, 109 Rutledge. One hundred nine Rutledge is requesting conceptual approval for renovations to the existing outbuilding. It's Category Three in the Harleston Village neighborhood, circa 1914, in the old historic district. For some context for you, it's located on the west side of Rutledge, south of Bennett. There's some existing site photos, courtesy of Google. Some sandboard maps depicting 1902 and 1944 conditions. The previous motion on August 27th was conceptual approval with staff comments one through six and board comment to eliminate second story porch on front in favor of covered one story porch and final review by board. Some of the board comments were agree with simplification, don't disagree about casement windows, have a reservation of deck over garage, provide floor to floor heights for next time, very logical. Second floor porch looks a little off to me. I'd rather see a covered porch. 
Another board member said, I agree with previous board comment about second floor porch. Third comment, agree with staff comments about roof deck. And with that, the applicant can take it from here. Thanks, Kim. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm Ashley Jennings. I'm representing my clients. Um, can we move to um, the, the plans, the site plans first? Oh, let's go back to this, these. Can we go back to the photographs, actually? All right. Um, there you go. Thank you. So the discussion last time was to eliminate um, the uh, walkout terrace that we had over the one-story element and to reconsider the porch element. And we're back tonight with the porch element um, just for reconsideration because of the door. There's a door on the second floor that's there. I know it's odd, and it, but it's been there a long time. And we'd like for the board to consider the porch element with that door as a walkout um, porch. But we've, we've actually changed the scale of the porch and remove the walkout terrace. So let's move to the floor plans. So here's the site plan. Um, once again, um, the only change in the site plan is that we reduced the width, the overall width of that porch element. Um, and then move to the next drawing, please. And you can see here, porch element on the, we're still showing a second floor terrace element that comes out over the first floor. And on to the next one. And so here you can see our proposal. Um, there was some discussion at the last meeting um, from neighbors about concerns about privacy in their yards, um, being able to view from this um, carriage house into neighboring yards. And so, the idea was to remove the terrace element over the one story and to then once again short, shorten or narrow the width of the porch element across that facade. And the next slide, please. And you can see that there's no element there anymore on the terrace element on the one story. Next slide. One of uh, the staff comments had to do with the existing hoods that were over the windows. And you can see um, the hood that projects on the east face of the building that was removed. And um, in a discussion with staff about that, we, we decided that we would prefer to have sh operable shutters and, the, and to replicate those existing hoods would mean that you couldn't put an operable shutter on the windows. Next slide. Once again, you can see that, that hood element. Next slide, please. Um, so here are the existing um, and proposed, existing proposed elements of the, um, from the streetscape. Next slide. Um, existing and proposed, as you can see down the driveway. Next slide. Um, and this is the previous proposal and the current proposal. So once again, you can see the um, narrowing of that porch element. Next slide. Um, previous and current proposal with the narrowing of the porch element and also the removal of that terrace element. Next slide. Um, the removal of the terrace element in this one. Next slide. Oh, that might be it. All right, I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? <clears throat> um, I do. Ashley, do, is part of this somehow increasing the height of the structure from the existing? I, I, I wasn't here last time, so I apologize if you already went through that. Awesome. Right, I apologize. I didn't bring that up. Um, there, we did, we are showing, you can see the dashed line here on these elevations. Um, we are proposing to raise the structure a little bit. Kim, can you go back to the um, the elevation? I've been a three point or a four point one. 
Um, so we are proposing to raise the structure a little bit. Um, right now, the, the entry element, I don't know if you can see on the lower elevation, the floor level is actually subgrade mm -hmm. on the structure. And there's, it's just a dirt floor right now. Um, and there's a lot of sill damage. And so the idea is to actually raise the structure enough to put a slab that would be just slightly proud of grade mm -hmm. and then to create some sort of curb element there to give new bearing to that framing. Um, that's gonna be something that, um, I hate to say it's gonna have to be decided in the field to some degree. I mean, I think with the intent that the board recommends, but the idea that there's gonna be some amount of sistering on every single stud on the house, the sill is completely gone. So the idea is to give enough room there to, to create some new way to sit the building back down on a slab. And so you can see that we are proposing, a, I think it's a one foot six, um, rays of that structure just to get it to where we can set it back down. And then um, I'm curious, the grade elevation there is, I mean, if you did want to make it compliant with FEMA, like how far are you off? Because that's not referenced on here. Um, we're yeah. about eight feet off. Okay. I mean, we're really technically a full story below base flood elevation here. And the idea is to get a FEMA variance for the structure. And I was just going to ask, because I know they've been a little more vigilant and um, discretionary about how they're reviewing those things. Have you just confirmed that with the age and condition of this building that, that you can get that? I hope so, but I'm just curious. Um, I didn't know that they had been more restrictive with that lately, but this is a property that um, the Historic Charleston Foundation has an easement on. Um, they're very concerned about maintaining it, so I would hope that it would be considered um, historic and worth Granting the FEMA variance. Cool. I hope so too. Cool. Thank you. Um, Ashley, it's Glenn. I just have one question. So the the 18 inch rays, when I'm looking at the ground floor and the door to walk in, am I confused with the, the 18 inch? Are you walking into a foyer that then steps up or am I am I interpreting that 18 incorrectly? I know it's, it's a little confusing. The idea is you can see that that grade, the ground floor elevation now, we have a new ground floor elevation. The idea being that um, to some degree, the, the siding at the bottom of the building is gone, right? There's, there's not much left of the siding that's in contact with the ground. And the building's going to have to be um, raised just to repair the sill, right? Does that make sense? So yeah. they're gonna they're gonna take the building, they're gonna they're gonna put it on some sort of bracing and raise it up in order to cut every single stud, remove the damaged cell, and then set it back down. And when they do that, um, there's gonna have to be some sistering that happens to create good bearing at the bottom of those studs. So the idea is we've gave it, given it a little bit of a gap, one foot six. That could be something that the board says, you know, if you wanted to limit the amount, but the idea is to give us enough room there to do the work that we need to do and then to set it back down on the slab. So yes, the building is growing essentially by one foot six at the bottom to accommodate that move. The idea being that there'll be a new sill there and there'll also be some sort of concrete curb or foundation that comes up for that new sill to sit on. And so it's possible that the sill of your front door might be a little higher than what you're showing here, right? Depending right, but the, yeah, but the intent is not to, not to create a crawl space there to put its slab on grade to reference the way that the building sat on the site previously. It's just that what's happened over time is the dirt has built up around the foundation or the, the, the bottom of the, of the building and there's a dissimilarity between the grade and the floor inside floor inside the building. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a slide just showing the uh, the structure in relation to the primary structure? Height. Oh. It's at the Okay, thank you. 
Um, any other questions? Uh, all right, so let's go to uh, public comment. We have one member of the public speaking, Luda April Wood. Historic or April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has an easement on 109 Rutledge Avenue. We have reviewed and approved of the proposed alterations to its easement property. We believe that the applicant has addressed the concerns of the BAR and we respectfully recommend approval of this application. Thank you. Um, Alex, if there's no other live comment, I'll read a couple of letters we received or is there one? No. <clears throat> Um, no other live comment. Great. So uh, first letter, my name is Joe DePore. My comments have already been submitted. Our concern remains, number one, the height of the building on our lot line. Number two, the grand tree, not more than two feet from the lot line in our backyard. Number three, the zoning issue is this is a one or two family lot. Potential use may violate zoning. We reserve the rights as all rights as neighbors on the lot adjoining the property to file necessary pleading to have a court determine if a zoning violation will exist if a dwelling unit is permitted. Number four, we object to the porches on the front as this is a historic building and the second floor porch is not appropriate, not a character. I'm out of town on business and will not be present for the meeting. Um, the next letter comes from Tom Bax and Jack Meese uh, who write that, that uh, they at 992 Bull Street remain firmly opposed to any second floor non-original porches on the historic 19th century structure. We request clarification on the number of proposed overall units at 109 Rutledge. Will there be three or four units? Does the building code permit four units? All vertical dimensions have been added to the drawings. They make little sense. Both existing and proposed heights are identical with the exception of the one foot, two inch dimension with an unclear note. Will the first floor be partially below grade? Will the new structure be only one foot, two inches taller? The dimensions raise more concerns. Uh, finally, a balcony located at the outbuilding gives us pause since the August 27th BAR meeting. Noise at 109 Rutledge has increased significantly. The residents have had countless loud outdoor gatherings to as late as 5 a.m. Second floor balcony would provide 109 Rutledge with more outdoor space for additional uh, individuals to gather during the day, into the evening, late in the morning. While architecture is the primary purview of the BAR, current situation is untenable. Quality of life issue for all immediate neighbors. Uh, why would a, a neighbor support additional living unit or balcony. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go to public, excuse me, staff comments and recommendation. Uh, the renovations are appropriate and positive and rehabilitate the neglected building. Uh, I think the next two Ashley has addressed, um, the entry door should be resized to relate to the first floor or ground plane and add a porch flooring and, and stair to access the door. Staff's recommending conceptual approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Okay. Um, Ashley, you want to clarify or respond to public and or staff comments? Um, yes, I'll, I'll go ahead and address the zoning issues. Just I know that this isn't under your purview, but there seems to be a lot of concern about that. I, I mentioned this at the last meeting, but the intent is to renovate this building. The front building right now, is a, it has three units in it. Um, and the intent is to renovate that building, create two units in the front building, um, remove some of the additions and some of the porch infill that's happened on the front structure um, and make this the third unit. So from a zoning standpoint, the intent is not to increase the number of units by any means. It's, it's number one, to find a good use for the rear structure and and focus on renovations to that structure first because it's in such bad shape. Um, as far as the neighbors go, I, I, I wish I could control um, what the neighbors, I mean, I, I can't control what the people that are living in that apartment building do, unfortunately. Um, but I think that the intent on my owner's part, my, my client's part is to remedy some of this by getting by moving forward with the renovations to the back building so he can complete his building plan for this project. Um, in regards to the confusion with the um, dimensions for the overall height of the building, it, the intent is not to try to provide any kind of confusion there. 
it's just a, it's a difficult way to document something that um, has occurred over time. But the intent really honestly is to show y'all and be honest with you that the overall building height will change a little bit as the building is pulled out from subgrade. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so let's go to uh, board discussion. Anybody feel like kicking us off on this one? I guess um, it, it, if I'm allowed, um, I have one additional question for Ashley. Um, it's Glenn. Um, Ashley, just because I, unfortunately, we can't zoom into the, um, the the drawings on the on the Zoom file, and then I'm I'm sitting here trying to go through our Dropbox folder. But I think it's easier to ask you: Is the the existing second floor door that you're proposing to walk out onto this balcony? onto this porch, is that door remaining the exact height that it currently is, or, or is it currently lower than what would be the second floor plate in the renovation? I just, it's hard to tell when looking, you know, at on the current screen at the top drawing uh, and the bottom existing, just because there are things that don't line up based on the extent of your proposed work. The intent is to leave the door exactly where it is. Okay. And the intent, you know, right now the floor is partially gone inside the building. Um, the, amount, the amount of um, measurement we could do inside the building was tough. Um, but the, the, the way that it looks inside right now, that that door access the second floor. Um, and, and the intent is to leave it in that same condition that it would access the second floor and be in the exact same spot. And ideally, if we could save the door, we would save the door. So in the, uh, the a quick follow-up to that, in, in what is currently zoomed up on our screen, to the right of the existing door, what are the, um, the little vertical dashes that look like joist pockets or something? I'm, I'm just sort of confused as to what I'm reading on, your, on the drawing there. That's, there's a um, board, a siding piece missing right there. Okay. And um, those are joists. Okay. So if those are joists, then that, that makes the existing door. I'm sorry, I meant, I meant studs, I'm sorry. Gotcha. <laughs> those are studs, okay. sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we were in going into uh, board discussion. Don't make me call somebody. <laughs> I'll start. I mean, I think it's a, a fine reinvention of, of this little structure. Um, and I personally feel like the request for that bit of height to work with is, is reasonable. Um, yeah, I have no problem with it. Um, I agree with Julia and, and with staff, I think, um, uh, the way the front door addresses the first floor porch when the new footers are poured and the building set on it is a detail that's probably going to have to be worked out with staff as it moves forward. Um, I understand that. Um, issue is they're not quite sure how that's going to work out when they lift the building up. I'm assuming they're going to pour a, a monolithic slab footer there and then set the building back down on it and so that the first floor elevation is going to get slightly above grade and that's going to affect the bottom of the first floor door and how that detail ends up being worked out but i think staff and the architect can work that out i agree with staff i, I asked to see the building's height in relation to its primary building and, and it seems to be you know, in proportion to the primary building and the surroundings. So I, you know, I, and I understand the need for the additional height. Um, I don't have any other comments. I, I agree with what's been said. I do think, I think it's probably important perhaps to set a not to exceed on that, um, just so that staff can determine exactly what that finished floor ends up being. Um, and then I, I remain a little opposed to the second floor um, balcony 
just because I think that door was only put there for an exterior stair that no longer exists. So it's sort of a, a reinvention of what that is. But um, I do certainly concur that the, the effort to pull it inward uh, is far better than what we were looking at previously. Okay. Um, anybody want to continue refining those conversations on the, the porch or otherwise, or are we ready for a motion? Oh, sorry, I had one more question. Are sure. there are there skylights in the roof on the back? Did I see that? Are yes. we okay with that? I mean, generally the board doesn't encourage skylights, especially in a historic building. Did did the did staff have any comment about that? Do not. Uh, I don't think they'd be visible from the public right away. Okay. Um, anybody want to float a motion? Yeah, I don't. I don't think those would would if if Secretary of the Interior has to be consulted on that. I don't think skylights would be compatible. But I'll leave that to the staff to determine. Um, okay, I can make a motion for conceptual approval with um, final and final review by staff. Anybody wants to add something to that? I just think clarification, Julia, of the uh, finished floor height uh, is important because I know I think some of the comments we've heard had to do with the raising and the height. Um, and I think that's a little, a little bit of an unknown at the moment. I agree with Glenn on that. I think, I think putting some limit on that as a staff comment might be worthwhile. And, and to Glenn's point about the skylights, I, I mean, I agree if it's not visible from the, from the, uh, right away, we don't have purview, but I guess we could make a board comment to consider not installing the skylights. Uh, could you guys, one of you, maybe fix that motion? Take it over. Um, Lynn, you want to go for it? Um, no more. What do you think, um, given the work that needs to be done, if you were going to to consider a not to exceed height increase, what's a reasonable cap on that? I mean, what's been dis discussed is is 18 inches. You know, I think, um, I, I, of course, not knowing what the interior existing grade is um, relative to the exterior grade, um, you know, and if the building is currently sitting, which I'm assuming it is, is if we're looking at the, the photographs in the base of the building, which fundamentally has no foundation now existing, is sitting at grade. Um, you'd need to come up, I think, a, a minimum, the finished floor would need to be probably a minimum of four inches. And I would want that to be the slab underneath and then whatever build up on top of that to create an appropriate finish on the floor. Um, I think anything less than, than four inches above grade on that slab is would be unacceptable. So, I mean, we uh, it, they're going to probably have to, to support the building and whack off the bottom for workroom, and then and then uh, excavate and pour concrete, and then reframe the building down uh, to the slab. So, um, you know, the, the building is pretty subordinate. I think if you if you had a had, you know. If you ended up in the building 12 inches higher than existing grade, I think that would be a gracious plenty. Well, let me, maybe, let, me, let me ask a question. Are we making more of this than we need to? I mean, right now the drawings show a <clears throat> foot and a half elevation increase. And so I'm sure there's some sort of, you know, a few inches of grace in there, but if the building ended up being, you know, 
three feet or four feet. I mean, that's not what we've approved. I mean, that that's like, that's just going out and building a building that, you know, hadn't been approved. So, I mean, there's already sort of a, an inherent check in the whole process on preventing something like that. You'd have to come back through. Okay. Yeah. I think, Jay, to me, it's more of just keeping that ground floor relation of a building that has always been on the ground. It, it shouldn't be up in the air. Um, okay. So I, I'll try to revise that the, the motion from Julia. Um, so I'll make a motion for conceptual approval with staff comments and a board comment uh, for the finished height to be clarified with staff and not to exceed 12 inches above the current height and final review by staff. Glenn, did you want to maybe omit the staff comments? I think Kim said two and three were no longer. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like three. Well, I, I feel like three is applicable. Okay, keep it. I'll second it. All right. So, <clears throat> make sure I heard you right. So, you made a motion for conceptual approval. Staff comments noted, uh, and board comments to consider removing. Did you say it was consider removing the skylight? Um, I can't remember if that made it in there. And number two, that the finished height is to be clarified with staff and not to exceed 12 inches above, you know, the drawings approved. I did not put the skylight in there because I, I think that boils down to an easement holder. And if they're doing any kind of tax credit um, work, that would have to be evaluated by the state. Okay, so, so then what you said was central approval, staff comments noted and one board comment that the height be clarified with staff, uh, but not to exceed 12 inches above, you know, the, the, I showed the drawings. Correct. Final review by staff? Yes. All right, final, and final review by staff. All right. Um, is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. All right, uh, I'll call the um, Glenn. Yeah, in favor. Julia. Yay in favor. Bill Moore. Yay in favor. All right, chair votes yay in favor. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next gen item is 62 Queen. 62 Queen is requesting final approval for a mural on the Eastern facade. The building isn't rated in the French Quarter because it's new construction built last year, but the main building is um, built in several iterations, 1886 to 88, 1944 to 51, and then again, 2019 for the new building. It's in the old and historic district. Here's a little aerial for your context. It's on the north side of Queen between meeting and church. Here's an existing site photo. And here's the location of the proposed mural. And this image is looking west on Queen Street and looking east on Queen Street. This is an image of um, the, the drawing of what is uh, existing now, which is at the bottom of the page. And with that, the applicant wants to take it from here. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll try to put put the video on as well. Um, okay. Uh, uh, well, I'm just going to say a few things about Queen Street, which is, you know, one of the more eclectic arteries from east to west. I mean, there's uh, hotels, galleries, restaurants, stores, residential. There's even a mural uh, a block away from this site. And um, this is a, a, a rare uh, commission uh, from, a, you know, a, a, a couple is, that, ha that really has no commercial underpinnings, which most things um, do, that's in most, most of my exterior projects do. And, uh, but I think for them, it's, it's a, um, 
it, it, it's it's a they're very engaged in in civic uh, life there. They they've done a lot towards uh, uh, raising about Diane Brown. I don't know if everyone's familiar with her. I certainly wasn't, but a a, a renowned uh, African American antique dealer, and uh, they've just recently uh, for their work in the front building um, uh, gotten a National Historic Registry. And so, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> they're new to town, but they, they uh, you know, they, they, they have a, a kind of a civic consciousness, which I admire. And, and so in choosing the subject, uh, this is Charles II, who was the, you know, progenitor of, of Charles Dunn. And, uh, and this is the 350th anniversary of, of Charlestown town, or, you know, uh, was it, uh, 1670, I think he uh, bequeathed it. And uh, he was a rather uh, a colorful figure. He was called, uh, sometimes called the married monarch. He had uh, a playful, uh, very humorous nature. He was, uh, but he was well loved, and he was a fairly effective uh, monarch. And uh, so I think with this this image of him, I spent a good bit of time trying to impart some of that, you know, personal charm. I think, and uh, um, you know, I guess with a mural, it's pretty much what you see. <laughs> you know, it doesn't. Uh, um, what you see there is what we're talking about. We, we considered it uh, at times including more of an inf information about him, but now we've sort of reduced it down to just uh, his name's sake, uh, his name on that seal. And uh, I think uh, the idea is maybe provoke some curiosity uh, about Charles II and people can sort of figure out who he was. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, any board member have any questions right now? Okay. Um, is there any public comment? We have three members of the public speaking. We'll go first to Stephanie Wilson Gentile. Let's see. And You'll just need to unmute yourself and then you can speak. Hi, hi, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, thank you for allowing us to speak. I'm with my husband, Michael. So this is Stephanie Wilson Gentile and Michael Gentile. We're at 54 Queen Street, very close to 62 Queen. While we appreciate the work that the owners at 62 Queen have done, and they have done a marvelous job on this building, I personally do not feel that this mural is a good aesthetic for the French Quarter Neighborhood Association or for the city of Charleston. And I'm gonna turn it over to my husband to speak a little bit more. Thank you. Yes, hi, good evening. And we do appreciate the time. And as my wife, Stephanie indicated, we, our comments are not a reflection on the talent and capability of the artists there about this particular mural. Um, to give you perspective, we're at 54 Queen Street, which is two doors down the one building in between us is a single story building. And so from our second floor, we have a continuous unimpeded view of this wall. And we would have a continuous unimpeded view of this mural. And, uh, and a mural of any kind really needs to be chosen with great care. And it will change greatly the look, the feel, the traffic flow character of the area. Traffic flow, people will stop and look at this thing and people will stop and stare. And uh, horse carriages uh, on tours which go by, they will stop and stare at this. And this, and so we must choose it very carefully. And while some mural might be suitable, this is not it in our opinion. Uh, it puts garish colors on a historic building that will be shocking and jolting every single day. It also depicts someone who looked down upon Charleston and his people, and this mural would be doing the same. He is by no means a revered character in our history whom we named the city for, 
but was instead a fearsome ruler who imposed his will on it. We can't remind ourselves of that in this very shocking way. And we oppose this most rigorously to its subject, its style, its size, and its placement on this historic building. Thank you. Okay, we'll go next to Anna Catherine Carroll. Thank you, Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society of Charleston. Generally, the Preservation Society is not opposed to murals as a reversible measure. However, in this case, we would encourage restudy of this request to reflect a design and color palette that is less distracting within this sensitive historic context. I think the previous neighbors um, articulated it very eloquently. And it also sounds like there is some really fantastic um, local history that is significant to this particular building that might be an interesting subject to pursue as this design is studied moving forward. Thank you. And third, we'll go to April Wood. April Wood, Historic Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the application for final approval for a mural on the eastern facade of this building. While we have no objections conceptually to a mural, we believe that the proposed mural is too large for the structure and takes away from the successful architectural improvements recently made at the property. We recommend that the scale and design of the proposed mural be restudied. We recommend denial of this application for final approval. Thank you. All right, Alex, if there's no other um, live comment, we received a number of notes. Uh, the first of which is from Susan Bass, who writes, as president of the French Quarter Neighborhood Association, I and my other board members do not find the proposed mural to be appropriate to the French Quarter neighborhood. The image is garish, not subtle, substantial in size, and highly visible from the street and other residents' homes. We ask you to deny the request. Margaret Peary writes that she thinks the mural is awful. Please decide against putting it on an historic building. Alice Wakefield writes um, that she's concerned that this mural will become a regular release stop for carriage horses as drivers pause to explain <clears throat> who and what th that mural represents. This will irritate cars held up behind the carriages and affect the livability for area residents, not to mention the horse leavenings and cleanup required at a relatively busy downtown intersection. I ask you to vote no on this mural request. Uh, and by the way, um, Margaret Perry is at 15 Council, Alice Wakefield's at 137 Church. Uh, e. Weinkoff at Court Street writes that uh, uh, respectfully asked to deny the application for the mural. While I appreciate the medium and this artist's previous work, I do not believe this mural fits the look and feel of French Quarter neighborhood. Thank you for your time. And Woody Rash at 23 State writes that the project is not in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. It's too large, garish, and intrusion to those that live nearby. It may also lead to further congestion if carriage tours stop to show it. Please vote no and prevent this outlandish mural, which has no connection to the French Quarter, from despoiling our neighborhood. Um, okay, so that's public comment. Uh, how about staff comment and recommendation? Yeah, murals are a challenging review, especially in the core of the historic district. The question we really need to ask ourselves is, does this enhance our city or does it detract from the architecture or quality of life? The precedent we have here is the hat man that was painted in 1892, small and discreet, and it holds some historic context in the city. The 16 hidden hats add a little bit of interest. This proposal is located in the old historic district, and so great care must be taken to respect the subtleties of the neighborhood. It should be reviewed with more scrutiny than something in the uptown, which has a bit more flexibility. This aesthetic deserves a high level of scrutiny because this matters. So we just have a few question, comments. Um, the proposal is 18 by 15 feet tall, excuse me, wide, on a wall that's 25 by 40 feet. So the proposal covers 34% 34, 34 of the facade. Though it's not considered signage because it's not an advertisement or related to the building use, it's important to note that the zoning ordinance limits signage to 10%. While art can enliven the public realm, the proposed location draws attention to the rear of an expansive parking lot. It will be visible from the cemetery of a category one building. The location's in a transitionary block between residential and commercial buildings, but it doesn't give justification for a cartoonish and trivializing depiction of the city's history. So the staff's recommending denial for this project. Thank you. 
Kim, thank you. Um, David, did you want to uh, respond or clarify public or staff comment? <clears throat> I'm sorry, was that to me? Yes, you have the opportunity to clarify anything you've heard or respond to anything. Well, uh, I, I know the, you know, the, as everyone knows, the front building is a historic structure. This is a, you know, brand new building. It's a completely blank wall, uh, sort of begging for, for some level of interest. Uh, um, and, uh, it's, it's in a parking lot. And, and so I, you know, to me, I, 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 I take seriously all the comments uh, regarding context, but um, it just seems like, uh, I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, a lot of things kind of boil down to taste and it becomes a very tricky gray area. But, uh, you know, I do think murals are able to enliven uh, the environment, and um, uh, I think this does that. I mean, I not, wouldn't be opposed to some um, uh, uh, mitigation, you know, with size or something like that, or perhaps color. Uh, um, so, I, you know, I, I guess I, I guess just the fact that it's really not a historic structure and it's in a parking lot, sort of to me takes away some of the preciousness of, of uh, you know, the context. So um, I, I hope the board sees fit to override the comments, but I'll leave it to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, all right, so we are in um, for discussion, somebody Feel like kicking off the discussion here? I'll, I'll start with a kind of an internal board question. Um, Julia, do you recall, because I think you and I may have been the only ones, Fillmore, I could be wrong, who were on the board when this was approved. Um, this building was built right up against the, the property line, which is why it did not have administration windows in it, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Julia, didn't we, was, wasn't there discussion about a mural, there definitely uh, was. kind of a TBD, you know, mm -hmm. later. So to that point, if, if Julia and I are both correct about that, I frankly have no opposition to a mural on, on this wall. I, I will, I'll, I'll gently just start off and then see what everybody else thinks by saying, I, I think perhaps this exact mural may be a little, um, a little harsh or a little personal. I feel like he's a pirate staring at me. I'm not sure. Um, but I, you know, clearly we know the work of the, the applicant and the quality of it. I'm just wondering about the subject of the mural, you know, in this particular case. Yeah, I appreciate that, Glenn. And, um, you know, originally coming into this, my personal take was that it was interesting and lively but I would have suggested that it be scaled down somewhat and that it be sort of pre-faded just to sort of decrease the intensity of those um, colors. That said, after listening to um, the presentation from the applicant and the public comments, um, particularly the allusion to, you know, Diana Brown at this very address, I, I sort of feel like there's an opportunity to do to, to switch gears and have the subject be something that really relates to that particular location um, and have it be a little more meaningful. I mean, I like you, Glenn, I really appreciate this um, applicant's work, but I think there's an opportunity there to, to shift and, and address a subject that is clearly meaningful and relates to that particularly particular address. Um, I agree with Julia. I think um, uh, that uh, this that wall certainly could hold an appropriate mural, but um, I'm not sure this is the right one. And so I think one uh, that has a little more um, 
thought given to relating to, as Julie said, relating to uh, that particular part of the historic district would be more appropriate. And uh, I'll um I'll go on a limb and make a motion for denial of this particular mural, uh, with a board statement um, of non-opposition to a mural of a different subject. Fair enough. Um, I right, so second that. Okay, so Glenn, your motion that was now seconded by Julia was denial uh, as to this application, but. Is it a board comment that uh, you know the board supports a mural, uh, you know, in this location? Yeah, a, a, a mural of a, of a different subject. Yes. The concept of a of a mural of a different topic, different subject. All right. All right. Uh, I'll call the roll. Uh, Glenn. Yay in favor. Julia. Yay in favor. Wilmore. Yay in favor. Uh, Chair votes yay in favor. So the motion passes unanimously. All right, we are at uh, agenda item number eight, 900 King. 900 King is requesting conceptual approval for the new construction of timber frame pavilion and prefabricated greenhouse at the Greenheart Urban Farm. Um, the surrounding area and context is a category one and it's in the North Central neighborhood circa 1886 and in the historic corridor district. Here's a little bit of context located on the east side of King and ordered by Hugey and some other street, Cleveland Street. Here's some existing site photos. Uh, this is from Hugey Street. And I think these are the earliest versions of Enston Homes. Yeah. from King. Some historic images from Habs. And with that, the applicant wants to take it from here. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, hello, this is Andrew Gould with New World Byzantine. Um, the site plan you're seeing represents the central block of the William Enston home site. Um, it has the large existing building, large historic building on the right, um, which was originally built as the gymnasium for the residents. Um, it's, now, it's now a house. Um, and then you can see the, um, the urban farm, which has been built in the middle of this field. And the urban farm is meant to include three new structures, which I've highlighted in brown on the site plan. The one on the left is the farmer's market shelter, which has already been built um, and approved by this board. Then the one at the top center is the timber frame pavilion, um, which I am working on. And then the one to the right is the proposed greenhouse, um, which I'll talk about briefly at the end. Um, if you could go on to the uh, next image. Here's some photographs to orient you. Um, so you can see sort of at one corner of this site is the historic memorial hall. Um, to the left, if you look, you can see that metal roof of the new farmer's market pavilion. And then to the right where the chain link fence is, that's roughly the site of the proposed timber frame pavilion. If you go on to the next slide, um, so there we are looking um, across the site at the, uh, at the pavilion location that's partially bounded by that chain link fence and going on in the next slide. So here we are looking up close. You can now sort of see the there's a roughly a square of gravel on the ground that that basically is the footprint of that pavilion, which will be 24 feet square. Uh, going on to the next one. 
Um, and then sort of stepping back and looking at the other direction, you can see the historic gymnasium building, that brick structure um, and going on. This is an image of the market pavilion um, that has already been built. This was designed by the uh, Clemson architecture students and go on to the next image. Um, you can see this, this is of course a, a very modernistic structure, um, but it's roughly the same size as the timber pavilion that's, that's before you now. Um, and I would just point out the roof of this building, which is, which is just silver or galvalume. Um, and we're going to use the same roof material on the timber pavilion, although on the timber pavilion, it'll be a hand crimped standing seam roof um, as, as opposed to a machine crimped roof like this one. Um, moving on. And the, the most architecturally significant structure here, of course, is the Memorial Hall. And I've, I've picked up these um, round windows in my design for the pavilion. If you go on to the next slide, um, the, the round windows are a rather pleasing, distinctive feature of this Romanesque architecture. Um, and I, I thought that was something worth, worth picking up on. Uh, going on to the next one. So here, here is um, my design. Um, a little backstory on this. The, the, the Greenheart Urban Farm is, of course, a nonprofit, and they've been getting folks all over town to donate their work to this project one way or another. Um, and this particular building is going to be done um, in part by the, the staff and the students of the American College of the Building Arts, their, their timber framing program there. And they, they came up with the kind of the bones of the timber frame they wanted to build here. So they handed me this 24 foot square hipped roof structure and, and the details for the bracing and the joinery they wanted to use in this. Um, and they asked me to basically draw it up and detail it because I, ha I have some particular expertise in timber frame design. Um, so I, I, took the, I took the sort of frame concept and fleshed it out into an actual piece of architecture. I added the, the dormer windows, the louvered cupola, um, and, and, and some other details to try to, to make it um, have the kind of uh, c civic beauty and formality that I feel it ought to have at the center of this important compound, complex of Victorian Romanesque revival buildings. Um, unlike, unlike the uh, Clemson design for the market, um, stand, it, it was specifically told to me that the intent here is to make this building more, more of a style of building that fits in with the historic structures, which it backs up right onto. Um, and, and I think that's appropriate given that it's timber frame, because of course, timber frame, mortised and pegged and braced timber frame like this actually originated as a Romanesque style of construction. There are there are Romanesque barns throughout Western Europe, um, you know, from the Romanesque era that are built like this. Um, and even in Victorian Romanesque revival architecture, you'll often see things like bell coats and well heads and, you know, little pavilion structures that are, that are timber buildings and detailed rather like this. Um, you know, so even though it's not a brick structure, it still actually does stylistically kind of fit in with that Victorian Romanesque architecture. Um, and I think the, the, round, the round windows and the, the louvered cupola they, they, and the hipped roof shape, they pick up a number of those formal elements that you see on the old buildings immediately surrounding this. And it'll be very nicely crafted. Again, it'll be all hand, handmade, heavy timber work. The, the roof will be hand crimped with hemmed seams like you'd see on a historic building. Um, and the, uh, it sits on a very short wooden platform. It's just a single step up off of grade onto that, onto that wooden deck. Um, and you can see in the floor plan that I've detailed that wooden deck in a, in a checkerboard layout, um, which, which I think will be quite nice. Um, this will have some, some furnishings that will go in it, into it as well. Some, some benches and work tables for outdoor classes, but that's that I'm going to treat as furniture that's going to come later. I don't think it's going to be a permanent part of the architecture. 
basically, I think the only permanent thing here is the, you know, the four posts and the roof, essentially. Going on to the next drawing. Um, yeah, so here's a detailed section through it. You can see the, you know, the, the floor plate is constructed with two by six framing on very stubby little uh, concrete posts to try to get it down as low to the ground as we possibly can. Um, they don't, they didn't want this to be actually on the ground just with a gravel or dirt floor because it's very distracting to the little school children who are going to be having classes in here to be, you know, constantly digging their feet into the mulch and so forth when they're supposed to be paying attention. They've, they've found that with these outdoor classrooms for elementary school children, you, it, it helps to have a hard floor surface. Um, um, and you can, and I, I really want it to be quite interesting for the children to be looking up through this. That's why I wanted to have these dormer windows. Um, I think it would be fun to have a little bit of colored glass in those windows, um, and then looking up into the into the dappled light of the cupola. Um, you know, I, th I think this will be a, f uh, a structure that they really remember when they take field trips and, and sit under this structure um, for for outdoor classes. Um, I'm going to turn the presentation now over to Jesse, um, who is one of the folks who runs the urban farm. I think he wants to say a few words as well. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, it's Jesse Blum, Executive Director with the Green Heart Project. Um, just providing a little bit of uh, context on this pavilion and how it's going to be used at the farm. Um, so the urban farm, if, if you're not currently aware, it's a uh, it's a garden that's used for the surrounding schools as a, as a school garden. It's a community garden that the residents who live at the instant home uh, can use as their own garden space. And um, we, we have uh, Andrew presented the, the farm market stand that we've already built there. We offer a weekly market. Uh, it's an asset for the whole community to come. We, we're sustained by a real small staff and, and, a, and a lot of volunteers. And so we, we view this pavilion as our main gathering space on the property. Um, a place where we can host groups of students for learning about what's happening at the farm. Um, a place where residents can come and rest and en enjoy what's happening there in the farm space. Um, perhaps a resting place for volunteers when they're working at the farm, come and rest under the building. So, and, and when we hold public events, you know, a potential gathering space for events as well. So I wanted to provide some context there to, uh, to the use of the pavilion. Um, and Andrew, do you, do you want me to get into the greenhouse portion as well? Uh, sure, if you could go into the next slide, Kim. Um, so this is a, this is a prefabricated kit greenhouse um, that, that Greenheart was considering purchasing for the site. Um, however, Meadows Construction has offered to design and build a, a, a more um, elegant structure out of out of brick and wood. Um, so I think I think at this point we're probably not looking for a specific approval of this greenhouse, may, maybe more of a discussion point. Um, but yeah, go ahead, um, Jesse, and, and talk about what you're thinking with that. Sure. So the function of the greenhouse, of course, would be to um, start plants that would then be uh, used at the farm. Um, we identified this greenhouse as one that would suit our needs. It's very standard greenhouse that you would see at a farm or a nursery. Um, and uh, as we moved along the process of um, designing and building the market stand with the Clemson students last year, and then designing the pavilion with Andrew, um, when we moved along to the greenhouse while we were thinking we'd use the prefabricated model, um, at that point in time, we'd started up a conversation with the folks at Meadows, and it just seemed fitting that we um, should pay the same amount of attention to detail to the greenhouse as we do to the other structures. So essentially we want to, uh, we want a custom design a, a greenhouse as uh, Andrew mentioned, using brick and, and wood elements. Um, it, would set, it would be very similar in size and same in function as the greenhouse that you're seeing here. Uh, we're currently working on that design with the folks over at Metters. Thank you both. Um, does anybody have a question right now? Any board member? Um, okay. So um, I gather that we're gonna just kind of table the question of the greenhouse at this point, correct? Well, you know, uh, Kim, Kim had a conversation with uh, 
with Drew earlier this week, Kim. I don't know. I think you provided Drew some. Uh, I guess staff is still going to provide some comments and recommendations here. But um, you know, I guess what we wanted to do, we we entered in the conversation with Metters really at the same time we were submitting this, and so you know, there is a bit of a change in approach to the greenhouse. So I, this is my. I'm new to the BAR process. I don't know exactly how we want to handle it. The idea is we want to put a greenhouse on. It'll be similar in size and function, um, but different, uh, you know, looking a little bit more elegant as Andrew put it. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. And then I did have one question for Andrew, which is super minor, like an invisible thing, but um, I assume you're still gonna have a structural engineer look at this. I was just curious why you were proposing the spot footings rather than anything continuous. Um, well, they 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 wanted a wooden floor, um, and so it's only it's only like one step up from grade. So I th I think um, I think if it were going to be a continuous slab, that would basically be the floor. Just the, the footing, the footing below grade. It's just a tiny question. Oh oh, oh 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 yes, you mean why not a continuous footing? Right. Um, well, I think that I think that's probably better for the trees. Is the reason this is ba this is basically under the canopy of a couple of huge pine trees, um, so that's that's why. Awesome. And then I'm sorry, I have one more regarding that step up, which I do appreciate. How are you addressing um, like wheelchair accessibility? What will you do for that? Yeah, that'll have to be addressed by Seaman Whiteside, which is handling the the site plan and civil stuff. Um, what they've told me is that they figure they'll just somewhere around the side of this structure, they'll, they'll ramp up the grade a little bit. Um, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen with, with masonry or, or wood, um, but the grade already kind of undulates around this structure. It's not perfectly flat. So I think, I think it's going to look quite natural for the grade to kind of ramp up and get a wheelchair on there on one side. But but they, they, they said they were going to work that out once they, once they actually get into, you know, pouring the footings and looking at the exact topography around it. Thank you. Um, all right, so if there's no other questions, um, is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, what, uh, how about staff comments, recommendation? The proposed pavilion is a community enhancement and it creates a usable space for the residents and neighbors alike and it's a positive addition. Um, and yes, I did have a conversation with Drew who let me know that this greenhouse was a, a placeholder of sorts. And so the placeholder greenhouse will be reviewed at a later date um, and the staff would feel comfortable reviewing it. So the staff's recommending approval with staff comments and final review by staff. Um, okay, so uh, Andrew or Jesse, do y'all want to respond to staff comments? No, thanks. Okay, so let's go into board discussion. Um, so Kim, to be clear on comment number two, when you talk about the placeholder greenhouse, you're talking about the matters design that's to come? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kim, I have a question. Um, this is the first I was aware that matters <laughs> was involved in this. Do I need to recuse from this or with the current greenhouse design, of course, which didn't involve matters at all, um, being a placeholder, uh, sh should I recuse or do you think it's okay for me to vote on this? Wilmer, just to be safe, let's just go ahead and, and have you recuse. Okay. So Alex will... Um, yep, I'll yeah, put you on hold and I'll bring you back in. I found more. <laughs> uh, so, um, back at it. So we were discussing. I guess. I guess we're discussing two things. One is the the application, and then two is the 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 matters design we haven't seen on the greenhouse. So, um, Julia, do you do you have any uh, immediate feedback? I mean, regarding the pavilion. Um, I have zero problem with it. I think it's um, suitably substantial and compatible with the existing architecture. It's nice. Um, I agree with that. And, and I mean, frankly, not to make things more difficult, but I selfishly kind of want to see the greenhouse. So um, 
I am comfortable with approval of the pavilion uh, as submitted, as well as the conceptual um, location of the greenhouse, the, the footprint location of the greenhouse. Um, but I do think that uh, the greenhouse details should come back to the board since we've reviewed the other structure, you know, the, the mm -hmm. built as well, just so we kind of have everything, you know, under one viewing. That sounds good to me. Yeah, I, it, it just seems strange to kind of, you know, blanket check, blank check, approve the greenhouse when, I mean, y'all are even putting those poor Clemson students through, through their paces. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and yeah. I, say, I, I think that's just, to, to be thorough and 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 frankly, because I I would like to see it. I'd like to see what yeah. they come up. With. Uh, we're all on the same page. <clears throat> um, so I can turn that into a motion um, for um, approval of the pavilion as submitted with final review by staff, and conceptual approval of uh, greenhouse location with details um, back to the board. At a future date. I'll second that. Okay. Um, tell you what, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. That sounds good. So um, the next agenda item is um, 65 pit and Sorry, Alex, could you, could could you, could you, you, uh, could you Sorry, reiterate good. that motion? Sure. It was, um, let's see here, final approval of the proposed pavilion and conceptual approval of the greenhouse location. Is that it, Glenn? Correct. Thank you. Um, and can somebody grab Fillmore? <laughs> Fillmore's back. Okay, good. Okay, 65 Pitt is agenda item number nine. Uh, 65 Pitt requests conceptual approval of a one and a half story accessory building at rear. The building is a category four in the Radcliffe Borough neighborhood circa 1900 in an old and historic district. Just a little bit of context for you. It's on the west side of Pitt Street, just north of Calhoun. And some existing site photos. There's the driveway view toward where the garage will be located. This image is looking north on Pitt Street. Here are the Sanborn maps from 1902 and 1944. And with that, the applicant wants to take it away. All right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, board. Um, I, my name's Becky Fenno. I'm presenting our design for an accessory building at 65 Pitt Street. Uh, next slide, please. This is on the left is the survey of the property. We are the smaller property on the left. Uh, and I was actually kind of chuckling earlier that it still says two-story brick building on the, on the street. We've actually, the board has allowed us to remove the asphalt shingle siding that had a brick pattern uh, and restore the wood siding on that front building, which we've already done. Um, you can see at the rear of the survey, the existing accessory building and the location uh, against both of the property lines at the south and the west and the size of that structure and the staff has approved the demolition of that non-historic building. Um, on the right is the 1944 Sanborn showing two small accessory buildings at that time. Next slide, please. Uh, on the top again is the is 65 pit. There are two driveways, ours is on the left and then the driveway of the neighbor to the north is on the right. And on the right, you can see, uh, looking up our driveway, you can see the existing accessory building at the rear of the site. Next slide, please. And this is the view of the driveway to the north of us for 67 Pitt Street. And uh, you can look 
the look at the visibility there. Um, and the, the other two photographs here are taken uh, from the property itself. On the right, we, it shows we're on the driveway uh, just north of us. And you can see there's actually an elevation change. We have a brick retaining wall and the rear of the site is about two feet higher. It's amazing how much elevation change there is at this point on Pitt Street. And on the bottom left is the existing uh, accessory building that's been approved for removal. Next slide. Uh, on the left is the south property line and you can see the neighboring property has a, a historic um, masonry accessory building. So I think actually the removal of our building probably will be, will be a good thing for that building, particularly given the condition ours is in. In the center is just a, a, the north elevation of our existing accessory building. And then on the right is the uh, driveway of the neighbor's property and their rear two-story building. Next slide. This is the site plan. So on the left showing the existing site plan with the existing accessory building, which has about a 700 square foot footprint and is tight to the two property lines on the south and the west. We propose to, to demolish that and to create a new footprint that complies with zoning. So the smaller 600 square foot footprint and to comply with the setbacks on the south and the west. And again, we think this is kind of a win-win to pull away from that uh, historic building on the south. And it also shifts the building a little bit further behind the main house on Pitt Street. And this plant, this has been approved by zoning. Next slide, please. This is the floor plan. I know you've seen these buildings recently. So we're showing the garage space on the ground floor with a pedestrian entry and a stair to the second level where we've created living space and a small office and bathroom under the roof. And um, again, similar to what you've been seeing, we're using the 1212 uh, roof pitch with the dormers that are at about 50% the width of the structure itself. Next slide. These are the elevations. And in a minute, you'll see how they relate to the main house uh, building which has a kind of a, a, a number of different window styles from horizontal casement patterns to uh, one over one uh, double hung windows. So we've really tried to maybe put a little bit of a contemporary um, spin on that vocabulary, but just keep this building very simple and subordinate uh, using the kind of a lap siding to reference the lap siding on the on the main house um, and to, uh, to reference some of the other window types on the main house. On the top left is the elevation facing the rear of the main house and the very left of the building and the very right of it will be seen. The dormer will not be seen and, the full, and only one vertical bay of the garage door will be seen. Um, the uh, top right is facing the south uh, property and will not be visible. And the bottom left is facing the west and will not be visible. But the bottom right will be facing the driveway of 67 pit and will be obliquely visible. Uh, and it has a pedestrian door with a, a horizontal pattern that references the casement windows on the existing building and the, the, the large window actually we, we felt like was a pattern that actually referenced the one over one building uh, windows on the main house. Next slide, please. So on the top is the Pitt Street elevation. So you can see on the left of the main house, looking up the driveway is, uh, is a kind of a portion of the rear accessory building. And then the bottom site section is through the driveway at 67 Pitt Street. So you can see how the elevation changes as you go back toward the rear of the site and the sort of um, range of window types that's on the existing building. There are horizontal metal casements 
there are one over one, there are six over six. So there's, there's just quite a range of window types. So we've tried to keep the accessory building to, to pick up on the voca those vocabularies, but keep it fairly simple. And that's, we're looking at the north elevation again on the uh, accessory building with the pedestrian door and the large window into the living space. Next slide. These are the sections just to show the volume of the building uh, with the garage at the ground level and then the living space under the roof at the second story. Next slide. These are the perspectives on the top. We're looking down the driveway of our property. So this is really the um, amount of the building you would see with just the left-hand portion looking at the standing seam metal roof that would match uh, or reference the main house and a little bit of that garage door with the horizontal uh, pattern that matches actually the horizontal uh, configuration of the mountains on the front of the house that we're looking at. And on the bottom is the view looking up the driveway at the north. So looking at that north elevation with the pedestrian door with the overhang and um, and the window and just there's a, a brief hint of the dormer but but not enough to see the actual front of the dormer and dormer window thank you okay thanks becky um any questions right now yep all right uh public comment we have one member of the public speaking we'll go to anna catherine carroll thank you um, the Preservation Society, sorry, Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society. We really appreciate the applicant reaching out to us on this request. Generally, however, we are struggling with the suburban proportions of this design. The height of the roof and the size of the dormers feel out of scale and should be reduced to better relate to the context and to allow this dependency to be more subordinate in scale to the main house. As proposed, the structure would be too visible from Pitt Street. If possible, we would ask that the garage footprint be reduced and shifted further to the right to be better concealed behind the main house. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Alex, to be clear, there's nobody named Carl Peterson that's signed up to speak? That's correct. I think it's a letter. Okay. I'm going to read Carl Peterson's letter. He says, hello, I have two questions. I would also like to be able to speak depending on the answers to these questions. Number one, what usage will this accessory building be put to? Number two, if it will be used as a residence, how many residents are expected to live there and where will these people park? Driveway alongside 65 Pitt is not large enough for a car to be driven through to the backyard. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's go to staff comments. Just a couple comments. Uh, the building is minimally visible, but the horizontal proportions of the double garage door are quite apparent from the street and starkly contrast the historic fabric of the block. If a two bay garage is necessary, subsequent proposals should include separate doors for each bay configured to appear as hinged doors. And finally, the dormers are oversized and ill-proportioned balance and restudy scale. Staff's recommending conceptual approval. Thank you. Okay, um, Becky, do you want to respond to public or staff comments? <clears throat> Uh, yes, I would actually. Um, it's it's funny the the driveway is narrow, but we have actually tested it. So um, it's actually we are able to 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 use that, and we we intend to. Uh, we did create the the wide garage door to make uh, the access a little bit easier to get in there and maneuver in and out. And thinking that it wasn't visible, um, that that is why we created the single garage door. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are in board discussion. Um, all right, I guess I'll start. Um, so, you know, well, I acknowledge that the, the visibility of the structure will be limited, but, um, but I still think that projects of this type on the peninsula are, are important and deserving of you know, respect and our scrutiny. So I have, I mean, I have no issue with the idea of an accessory building back there, no issue with living space above the garage, but in this design, the proportions are just missing the mark for me. And um, 
you know, the mass of the dormers is overwhelming and the vertical relationship between the garage doors and the fenestration is just out of balance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm confident a design could be, you know, developed that would be more elegant and still accommodate the desired program. But at this stage, it's just for me, it's not there yet. And I can't really point to, you know, one or two issues. I think it's, it's bigger than that in my estimation. It needs to be re, reconceived. Curious what other board members think. I mean, I'm generally in, I think, in agreement uh, with Julia, even though I think the, uh, the basic shape of the building and um, is probably is, is fine. I think the dormers are outsized. I think the, uh, the overhangs appear suburban and the windows seem out of scale. And the, uh, if there's a way to I think there's a way to configure that garage door so that it, it looks um, less imposing and suburban and still could be a single opening door because I understand the necessity to get two cars in there in a very confined space. But I, I agree with Julie. I think there's a lot of restudy that probably should uh, could be done here to make this building fit the neighborhood a little better. I, I am fairly well aligned with this comment, with the, with the the two comments as well. I I don't have an issue with the building, with the structure. Um, I think proportionately, you know, there there is some study needed, um, and I, I I'm comfortable that that the applicant can can get there. So, all right, let me ask a question of the three of y'all. Um, is it I'm, I'm it sounds like maybe the height, the general footprint, is it the massing? I'm just trying to figure out if we are uh, have enough to grant conceptual or if, if the massing or, or something about the building is not enough to, to where conceptual is warranted. Um, in my view, the height is perfectly fine, um, but the other three metrics are off scale, mass, and architectural direction. But I'd like to know what you guys think. Um, so I think the, the footprint of the building is, is probably close and the height I think is probably all right. Um, but I think the, uh, for me, it's uh, the architectural direction, I think the, I think there are elements of the building that are just out of scale, and and for me that uh, uh, that makes it it difficult to um, uh, to say that the architectural direction of the building is is appropriate. Glenn, you want to add anything, or are you lining up? Mm -hmm. I, I think the, to me, the hard, you know, it, it's how you're applying um, scale and mass uh, as far as it being a general or a, or a detail scale and mass. Um, but I, I am in agreement. I am comfortable with the location and the height of the proposed building. Um, so I, it, it's almost like I want to grant conceptual approval to the, the location and the height uh, and defer the other the other items, which clearly we can't really do. Um, what 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 are your your thoughts, Julia and Fillmore on, on that? Um Glenn, you didn't ask for my thoughts, but I'm gonna give them. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, I, I hear what you're saying, Glenn. I think we can be very clear in our commentary, which is the height is fine. Um, you know, we, we can proceed procedurally, whether we, it, it's just trying to be clear in, in, in what our instructions are. Um, 
I'm, I'm feeling like it's, there's still enough sort of vagueness in our comments where conceptual approval is, is probably not warranted. Uh, that's just me trying to read the tea leaves here. Uh, and let's just be clear on height's fine. You know, the footprint's fine. Uh, and then here are the issues and whether we call them scale or GAD or mass. I mean, let's just try to be clear in what we're seeing. Is that, I mean, uh, but I think you get to the same place regardless, procedurally. And I don't mind like just, just articulating a couple of specifics for what it's worth. Um, I mean, to me, just the scale of the dormer is really out of proportion with the scale of the footprint and the gable, that sort of thing. And the scale of the windows is exaggerated. And I feel like the second floor level is, is too low. And I realize they're trying to get maximum height on the second floor and they're limited to that 11 feet eight height, but that just results in some really weird proportions. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess, are you feeling like, Jay, like a deferral is appropriate and we just need to... I mean, if you could, I mean, it seems like if, 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 if we could agree and articulate on things like that, uh -huh. comments like that, then it, uh -huh. you start saying yes. But if we're still trying to figure out why and, and, um, and can't quite pen down our comments, then I'd, I'd, I'd feel like it's more of a deferral. And I and I, I'm just trying. I think you you've articulated very clearly, but I'm I'm not clear whether, uh, like for example, Fillmore would would agree to this that with that right. specificity, right, right. or if he still has some other thoughts that are a little more nebulous and where, you know, conceptual would not be warranted. <clears throat> I mean, I think uh, Julia's uh, on target with her with her comments. Um, I don't think there's any any question about that. Um, yeah. I think there's there's uh, too much work, design work to be done here for conceptual approval. Okay. And Glenn, did, what do you think, Glenn? Does that sound right? Or no, I I, I think we all agree that there are definitely some scale related issues and details to work out. So I, I, while, while I am comfortable with the building location, the building height, I, it may be best if we, if we do not all agree that um, height, scale, mass, and general architectural direction are all uh, boxes that we're checking, it may be best to offer a deferral to let her um, refine the, the building and restudy some things based on the comments. Okay. So I, I, I think we're all agreeing on a deferral and, and maybe if somebody could give the, you know, what do we think the cleanest or clearest reason for deferral is it? That's the hard part. I mean, I, I would hate to do this and I don't want to do this, but I was, I mean, initially inclined to, to deny it, but because I can't really personally have a really clear, concise direction if we gave it a deferral based on X. It's just a lot for me, but please, you guys try to work that out. Let's see. I mean, I, I, I am fairly well aligned with with the three staff comments that we were given, while they're a little broad, um, they, to me, offer most of the commentary that I would have come up with on my own. Um, so to me, it's either a deferral with emphasis or a denial with with staff and any board comments, um, I think at the end of the day we're asking her to do the same thing as the applicant. Um, if that, you know, if we were in a vacuum and 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 Becky couldn't hear this back and forth discussion, I don't know that she could get where 
-huh. I think she needs to be. But, right. but she's hearing the debate we're having and, and I feel confident that she can, can take that information and work with it. Can you make that a motion somehow? <laughs> Understand um, Julia's uh, comment. You know, I certainly couldn't make specific recommendations um, for altering the design of this building other than a very few things which Julius already mentioned and staff mentioned, and that is that, that the dormers are outsized and the windows are out of proportion and the garage work, um, uh, doesn't work um, as designed. But I certainly don't think that's the limit to what needs to, um, to be adjusted on this building. So it would, I think it would be difficult to give really good for me, anyway, it would be difficult to give really good guidance uh, relative to uh, a deferral with specific changes that needed to be made to the building that would bring it back with um, more assurance that it would get conceptual approval. Um, it, it's the it's the easy way out, but we could simply say denial and and uh, yeah. it, that, at least that's not misleading to the applicant. You know, like know. if you do this, then you get that because we're still trying to feel that out. I was just gearing up to to try that, and that I I like this applicant, and I don't like to mm -hmm. deny things, but I think she's hearing that we have you know a very receptive. Um, inclination when it comes to a structure here of this general size footprint, that sort of thing. But um, in terms of this design, I think it's there's too much that needs to be addressed. So um, I'll make a motion for, we call it a soft denial based on um, scale I'll include mass because the dormers do contribute to that and architectural direction. Um, all right, is there any other discussion before somebody wants to second that? I'll second it because I think it's the most fair thing to do for the applicant. Um, and then she can take the pieces of what we've told her do work and, and, and go from there. All right, so Julie's made a motion, which Glenn has seconded, and that's for denial for scale, mass, and GAD. Um, all right, I'll put it to a vote. Um, Julia? Yeah, in favor. Glenn? In favor. Uh, Fillmore? Yay, in favor. All right, chair votes yay in favor. So the, the motion carries unanimously. Okay, uh, next gen item is 11 Hanover. Eleven Hanover Street is requesting conceptual approval for the new construction of two single family dwellings. It's new construction in the east side neighborhood in the old city district. Here's an aerial image for context. And some existing site photos. These are the adjacent houses. And across the street. And if the applicant wants to take it from here. Hey there, this is Joel Adrian. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, thank you for your time this, this evening. This is uh, my first appearance in front of y'all in probably a little over a year. Um, we, uh, we have under construction the house at Nine Hanover, right uh, adjacent to this lot. And basically we are wanting to, uh, to duplicate the exact same structures, two buildings uh, at nine onto 11, uh, same client owns both properties. Um, Kim, if you'll go to the next sheet, it should be the site 
plan. Um, so this is the existing uh, conditions. Um, you see uh, Nine Hanover has the uh, two, two buildings that are currently under construction. They're both framed. Um, and then to the left of the, uh, of the two is the one-story brick house to be demolished. That's uh, the existing structure at, uh, at 11. Um, next slide, please. And so then this would be the um, uh, proposed site plan. So you can see it's literally taking the exact same two houses there on nine and transferring them over to, uh, to 11. Um, we've received our uh, zoning approval for uh, for the two, I will say there is there is a uh, there are two differences in the front building. Um, if you look at the uh, the front building at nine Hanover, you'll see the HVAC units um, sit basically on slabs on the grade, and we are proposing to um, uh, use these uh, uh, slimline Mitsubishi units that we would cantilever um, off of the back of the house to uh, increase the width of um, uh, the parking space is between the two structures, which allows for the vehicles to better get in and out of the lot. Um, and so then the next slide, uh, that's the just the auto turn. I guess we can go to the next slide. Uh, the Sanborn map from 1888. Um, next slide, please. And there it is at 1944. And our next slide. Um, so those are actually pictures of the existing little one-story uh, brick house that's uh, on uh, 11 Hanover. And you can see the construction uh, adjacent to it. Uh, we'll continue. Maybe we can get to the actual um, floor plans elevations. Really, I, I guess there's our aerial context um, and, uh, and floor plans. So the front, the front house is going to be a two-and-a-half-story structure. Uh, we have it, I believe, um, 18, 20 inches above grade. Um, and, uh, and then the back house, actually, this is probably the next slide, will be the elevations of it. So you can see the um, east street elevation, uh, typical single style house. Um, but again, the, the exact same house that was approved about a year and a half ago, and currently under construction at um, number nine, the uh, south elevation shows um, that HVAC cantilever, um, as do the uh, west and the north. Um, so next slide. And this is the, um, uh, the second structure, uh, which is just a two-story uh, structure. It is um, smaller in, in width and length and overall height uh, to, to make it a dependency to the, to the uh, front building. And next slide, please. Uh, those are elevations for that. So the uh, east elevation facing the street, um, simple structure. And, um, and also, I guess, uh, probably not a whole lot else I need to, to say. And I'll just be, be present for questions um, that y'all might have. Okay, thank you, Joel. Um, any questions? <clears throat> One, just so the, the sister houses, so to speak, on the other lot have already received final approval and they're permitted and under construction, correct? That is correct. They're, they're both framed out, um, I believe, waiting on windows um, to be delivered. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, is there a staff comment? course. Um, yeah, the general architectural direction is positive. Uh, it's appropriately cited and scaled. Um, the only comment we have is to remove and relocate the cantilevered HVAC unit off the rear of the building. Um, that said, I'm, I'm not sure how visible from the street it is, but the staff's recommending conceptual approval with final review by staff. Thanks. Okay. Um, Joel, it sounds pretty good. Do you got anything to respond to there? No, I think that um, we could probably, because those units were, were very tight, so I could probably locate them on the ground um, and, and towards uh, the property at uh, 9, 11, 13, 
um, on that side, which would still give the vehicles plenty of ability to turn in and park and, and back out, and not have to cantilever. Okay. Uh, board discussion. Uh, any any board discussion? Um. Uh, so, I realize that we have already reviewed this exact design, and and I know that I remember going through an evolution there. And so I'm just gonna offer a couple of like tiny little suggestions for the applicant that he might wanna consider um, for this house and then possibly even if it's not too late for the other. And these are yeah, just for what they're worth. Um, the brick steps at the piazza entries should really be wider. And these are just some things that we were focused on other elements in the bigger picture before, but when I reviewed it this time, I picked up these things that I'm just gonna articulate. Because um, the brick steps now are the width of your door and they really should be at least wide enough to match the door and the surround and the plinth blocks. So if you would consider okay. doing that. Um, and then there might be a discrepancy in your details for the window sills. I think on A8, there's a reference to treated sills with a historic profile, but on A9, there's a reference to a hardy sill and it appears to have a skirt board below the sill. And obviously the one on A8 would be preferable. Okay. Um, and then you have a good detail for the porch ceilings to address, to, to address the joints in the hardy panel, but no RCP to sort of dictate where those joints would be. Um, and then to my eye, the porch columns are a little fatter than they need to be, especially when you have a relatively low ceiling height on the first floor. Um, so I, mean, I, th I just think a 12 inch round column is a little too much for a house of this scale and a porch of this scale. Those are just my little observations that came up, you know, this time. Thank you, I'd be glad to address all those. Sure. Julia, what column size were you recommending? I mean, I just think they should be reduced a little from a full foot, you know, 10, 10 would be fine. When you zoom in on that, they just look like they're overweight. I didn't catch that, thank you. They were sized in relation to the guy that drew them. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> All right. Um, any comments to add to Julia's? Oh, all right. So my yeah, I, I think Julia's pretty, pretty, pretty spot on there. I would support her commentary. Okay. So, Julia, was that a motion for conceptual approval with? staff comments noted and your three staff comments, excuse me, your three board comments? Uh, sure, except I would honestly, I don't really have a problem with that cantilevered HVAC. I, I think it's, it's nice from a ground level to have those things picked up and removed. Um, and I don't think you would really see it from any public point of view. So it would just be, um, you know, we don't really need any staff comments unless you want to include the compliment of number one. Um, does that sound good to uh, y'all to eliminate staff comments? Um, yeah, on the assumption that they're not visible, yeah, I would, I would eliminate staff comment. I, I think if they, if they are visible, um, I personally am opposed to see them hanging on the side of the house. But if they're not visible, then yeah, we don't have purview anyway. Right, Jay, is there a way we could like um, nail that down? Kim, do you, what do you think? Is it visible, Kim? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe Joel can answer that. If you go um, back to the uh, elevation, maybe A3, um, oh, A2, there you go. Oh. Back up one. So looking at um, where they're located, I had them shifted on the back of the house. If you look at that west elevation, um, and it was really just trying to trying to give them some relation to the windows that were there. So they were kind of centered on 
on, on those window units. Um, I, I don't believe you'd, you'd see, uh, I don't believe you'd see from, from three of the sides, you might have, you might have an opportunity to see it as you're coming down Hanover passing the adjacent house at 13, if I'm being completely honest. Um, but really there's, they'd there stick out 30 inches with the enclosure, um, total off of the house. Um, so it, uh, I, I can't, I can't tell you a hundred percent now you're never going to see it. Um, they they because, don't seem to be drawn as 30 inches deep. Uh, go back to that elevation. Um, it should be. So on the floor plan and then as it sticks out there, that, that's, that's correct. 30. Yeah, I think they're probably min minimally visible, so I'm okay with Julia's motion. And they're screened, right? That's what we're seeing. The, yes, That's yeah. So the, the unit itself is is only like 16 and a half inches, um, so that the bulk of it is trying to get that treated, you know, two by or the two by frame around it, and, and the four by four posts that are going to hold everything up. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay. okay. So maybe Julia fire motion that I think. Okay. Um, all right. I'll make a motion for conceptual approval with final review by staff with um, the board comments that, that I think you already wrote down and an additional board comment to ensure that the HVAC platform is not visible. To the public, or that the approval of that is contingent on it not being visible. All right. So, help me out. All right. So, your your board comments are to widen the brick steps to the width of the door plus surround uh, to uh, put the siding as shown on on what is it sheet a8 still still detail on sheet a8 you'll use still detail on sheet a8 to reduce the size of the porch column to 10 inches and to eliminate visibility of the hvac platform from the public realm that, that works sound, right? that works yeah all right, so conceptual approval with those four board conditions noted, final review by staff. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, I got Fillmore. All right, so uh, Julia? Yay, in favor. Fillmore? Yay, in favor. Glenn? Yay, in favor. Chairman, yay, in favor. Motion carries unanimously. Um, Thank you all. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Next agenda item is 75 King. <clears throat> you. 75 King is requesting final approval for a new addition in Copper Hoods. Buildings of Category 2 in the Charlestown neighborhood circa 1739 in the old historic district. Here's some more context for you. Um, it's on the west side of King, just north of Trad. Some site photos. And this is from Trad Street, um, the arrow pointing to where the copper hoods would be visible. Mm -hmm. And some historic images, courtesy of HCF, and this is Charleston. Sandboard maps from 1888 and 1944. The previous motion from October 15th was conceptual approval with staff comment number one. The board commented more detail on addition and visibility may make addition more appropriate to staff. Um, willing to look at further refinement of drawings if deferred. At conceptual, this is appropriate. Tucked away behind the chimney, doesn't protrude beyond piazza. Um, generally appropriate. Another comment was agree with staff regarding width of hoods. Another comment was comfortable with the level of visibility at conceptual. Another board member uh, mentioned I agree with previous board comments. 
And then another comment was fine with it. So <laughs> it said, if the applicant wants to take it from here. Hey guys, it's Mark Moresca. I am representing Monica and Ken Seeger. Um, we've gone ahead and um, we have some computer generated drawings. And if I can go ahead and um, we can go to uh, sheet number three. It kind of gives us sort of the three areas we're talking about. One was a, a hood over a small entry um, addition, and then a hood over the central uh, original kitchen house, and then a small addition to the hyphen, which is their present kitchen. So what we have provided um, on page four is sort of how we're sort of approaching sort of the um, addition of the sort of kitchen house. We have a um, it's just very simple sort of sort of structure and um, glassy. And um, that provides the extra space in their, their present kitchen. Um, the steps will be brick. Um, if you go to page number six, okay. It shows um, the hood on the left over the existing door and the hood on the center of the existing door, um, and then the addition to the kitchen. Um, what we've looked at is the, um, the hood framing. We've got details of the hood framing. Um, it would be a diaphragm of wrought iron with just copper sheeting. Um, and then the, we, we've got a detail of the brackets. I think uh, Glenn had asked a detail of the bracket. So, um, that's on some further sheets. Um, the way the addition for the kitchen would be done would be very simple. It would be out of wood, wood recessed panels, um, wood true divided light windows, which match the house. They would be casement windows and a wood outswinging door just because of um, water intrusion. Um, the reason we have hoods for the two other doors, they're in swinging and they are brick floors and um, client has had water in those places at times. So um, the existing kitchen is um, a concrete floor and it will end up being a wood floor. So we are want to make sure that floor was protected. Um, the two steps coming out of the addition from the kitchen will be brick, which will match the brick um, work um, that was done by Sheila Wertimer and also matches the front piazza, which is um, flush with the ground. Um, there's a section of, there's also a side elevation on sheet number seven, showing that the window sort of module is sort of consistent as it goes around sort of that uh, kitchen bay. Um, we're showing um, a reuse of an existing handrail. Um, it's not old, but it's, it's, it's part of, it's a 20 year old sort of handrail. So we're, it's appropriate and it's wrought iron and it's, um, it's hand forged. But we're, that's where we're showing the actual the brick landing and the one step, step and um, the stucco um, riser. Um, we've got sections of sort of uh, how this will be constructed on page 10. So showing sort of again the um, existing handrail and sort of copper, copper roof and how we plan on structuring it and, um, and supporting it. And then there's another further section on page 11. 
and how it sort of engages. Um, there's a, a fireplace and how we're we're not we're 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 not proud of the fireplace, but we're recessed from the existing fireplace chimney. And then the last um, on sheet number uh, page page thirteen. It shows sort of a very, a very simple sort of section of a bracket and the bracket we're, we're assuming is gonna be around one and three quarters by a quarter. It'll be um, hand forged and be drawn at the ends. And it'll be just a, a very simple diaphragm with a, a copper roof. Any questions? Um. Thank you. Any questions? No. Yep. I'm I'm frankly comfortable with uh, with staff with staff's uh, recommendation. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, public comment and staff recommendation real quick. Um, so, is there any public comment? We have one member of the public speaking. We'll go to April Wood. April Wood of Stark Charleston Foundation. HCF has reviewed the application for final approval for a new addition and copper hoods over the doors at 75 King Street. We believe that the design is sensitive to the historic fabric and we recommend approval of this application. Thanks. All right, um, how about staff comments? Yeah, the applicant has followed board directive and included details on the hood brackets. So uh, moving forward, submit window details, including cut sheets uh, for wood, single glazed, true divided light windows, and submit the door detail. The staff recommends final approval with staff comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark, did you want to respond or clarify anything? Um, no. I, thank you very much. Great. Glenn, I think you were getting us into board discussion there. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> Well, I'll reiterate that I, I am uh, comfortable with staff's comments and recommendation. Okay, is there any other discussion? Second. All right, so Glenn's made a motion for <laughs> final approval staff comments. Is that a second by Julia? Okay. Yeah, um, all right, I'll put it to a vote. Um, Glenn? Yeah, in favor. Julia? Yeah, in favor. Gilmore? Uh, yeah, in favor. All right, uh, chair votes yay in favor, motion carries unanimously. Um, okay, uh, 12, excuse me, eight Troutman, agenda item number 12. Hi, Julia. Hi. Uh, number eight, Troutman Street is requesting conceptual approval for the elevation of historic single house. The buildings are Category 4 in the Harleston Village neighborhood, circa 1870 in the old historic district. Just a little bit of context for you. It's um, basically at the, at the uh, intersection of Trapman and Trumbo. The existing site photos. Two little houses. Here's the streetscape. And across the street, And if the applicant wants to take it from here. Um, good evening, board members. This is Erin Lanier with Julia Martin Architects here tonight on behalf of Bill and Ann Rimble, the owners of number eight and number 10 Trapman Street with a request to elevate these two historic structures. Um, I'm gonna present number eight first, of course, but just to give you a little background, our clients have been working for several years with Stephen Jolka at the city to get FEMA grant money to elevate these structures, both of which have experienced repeated damaging flooding for many years. Um, both buildings are duplexes and were intended to provide a little retirement income for the owners, but as a result of the flooding, they've instead required repeated repair and renovation. Um, both structures have been modified in the past and present some unique challenges in trying to introduce exterior stairs, 
but our charge here was not to completely rework the interior layout or correct every awkward condition, but rather to help the owners sensitively raise the houses um, so they are no longer in danger and make what select moves we can to improve their street presence. Um, so starting with number eight, if you'll go to the next slide, please. This is our context. Eight and 10 Trapman are part of a row of four single houses known as the Keller's tenements on the east side of the street and then on the west side, as Kim mentioned, is modern residential construction and a driveway. And generally this area is seeing an increase in elevations. And in fact, you'll be seeing requests for the structures directly behind these in just a few weeks. Um, next slide. These are some existing conditions images. A couple of things to note. The piazzas on this house appear to be completely reconstructed, likely sometime around 1999. And at that time, the piazza screen was introduced. If you enter through the piazza screen door, you'll notice that the south wall of the house has been partially furred out to help support the piazza above, and fenestration has been modified or in some cases removed altogether. Another feature to note is that the grade has been raised about 12 inches, both under the piazza in lieu of a proper porch floor and at the adjacent side yard, which is almost entirely paved. So you'll see in our plans, we'd like to eliminate much of the paving and address some of those conditions, including reworking the piazza screen. Next slide, please. These are our sandboard maps and a photo circa 1996 that just sort of informs our understanding, our understanding of some of the changes that have occurred over the years. Next slide. And here is our existing and proposed site plan. We're lucky that the property line here is actually about two and a half feet beyond the front of the house, allowing us to get a few steps there, which will take you to a landing just inside the piazza screen where another set of steps will get you to the first floor piazza. For not otherwise changing the footprint, our HVAC will remain on stands behind the house, but we will replace the pavement at the side yard with vegetation to help with the flooding and provide a nicer garden space for the tenants. Um, next slide, please. So when the house is elevated, the first floor piazza gets reintroduced. And while we can't eliminate the stair on the piazza to the second floor, it will be reconstructed. We're also hoping that the furred out wall at the south elevation can be eliminated and the window that was previously there added back. Next slide. Everything pretty much stays as is at the second floor. We think there are some column and railing elements that could be improved upon as well as just replacing some non-historic doors. Next slide. Here's our existing and proposed east and west elevations. Um, in order to reduce the number of steps we need to fit into such a small space, we're gonna be waiting for the new maps and those will require us to raise this house a little over six feet. We're proposing a traditional smooth stucco masonry foundation with louvered shutter type openings at the street facade. Then we'll have um, three new brick steps that go up to the reworked piazza screen. And the grade behind that will remain raised at the side yard, but we're proposing a new fence and pedestrian gate and then also suggesting the addition of bifold shutters at the front windows that give the house character. The rear of this house isn't really changing. It's not visible from any public right of way, but we'll have a combination of smart fence and louvered panels between piers back there. Next slide. Here's our side elevations at the south. We'd like to clean up the fenestration and restore the porch floor and decking at the first floor construct the new masonry and wood steps that get you to the garden level as well as to the first floor. And then, as I said, reconstruct the wood stair at the piazza that gets you to the, to the second unit upstairs. And again, we'll have piers with louvered screening under the piazza and then a solid foundation wall with smart fence towards the rear on the north side of the house. Next slide. I'll just end with our existing and proposed streetscape. We've shown number 10 at its existing height, um, but dashed in red there is where it will be once it's elevated as well, just to give you a comparison. That is all I have, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No more, Glenn, any questions for Aaron? No, um, I don't think there's any public comment. Is there, Alex? No public comment. Um, Kim, how about staff comments? Sure, uh, the proposal is appropriate and meets requirements set by the BAR. So the staff's recommending final approval pending new firm adoption on January 29th. Erin, you wanna argue with that or dispute it or anything? No, no thank you. All right, um, board discussion. Is there any? I, I agree with staff. Yeah, I do too. All right, is there a motion? Um, go ahead, Glenn. No, 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 Fillmore, I'd, you, you go for it. Okay. <laughs> Final approval 
pending new firm adoption on January 29th, 2021. Okay, Fillmore's made a motion. Glenn has seconded it. Uh, yep. All in favor? Aye. All, right. All right, next agenda item. Ken Chapman Street is requesting conceptual approval for the elevation on historic single house. Category four in the Harleston Village, circa 1880 in the old historic district. And this one is right next door. All right, so um, number 10 to the north um, is actually has its first floor even lower than number eight and the existing conditions here are even tighter. Um, I'll skip over the context images, which are the same as before. If you wanna go ahead to sheet number three. This house um, currently has a straight metal stair that is outboard of the very narrow piazza. And so this is our main challenge here. Again, similar to number eight, the piazza has largely been reconstructed over time, but there's just no way to get two sets of stairs in such a shallow space. Um, next slide. Here are our sandboard maps again. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So here at our site plan, you'll see really the only viable solution is to locate the stair to the first floor within the reconstructed piazza and replace the existing metal stair with a new spiral stair at the rear of the piazza. Um, similar to number eight, we think there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of removing hardscape and landscaping in the side yard and a new fence and pedestrian gate will also help create sort of a visual buffer at the sidewalk. Next slide. Here's our existing and proposed first floor plan. And like next door, we're proposing mason steps of a brick landing with wood steps continuing up to the new first floor piazza level. And then to get to the second floor unit, the residents would go through the pedestrian gate to get to the spiral stair and exit in the same location at the second floor piazza as the existing does. Next slide. There's really no changes here except for the stairs. Let's go to the next slide. At the front elevation, again, we're proposing a smooth stucco masonry foundation with louvered shuttered openings and new shutters up the water the foundation. And then you can see a representation of the spiral beyond. There really are changes to the rear elevation beyond the new foundation. Next slide. Can y'all still hear me? Uh, you're, just, you're fading in and out on me. Uh, my screen looks normal. Let's see. Oh, can hear you Anybody yep. hear me? Yep. Aaron, you're back. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, at the south elevation, the stair up to the first floor will be concealed by a solid masonry wall, which is a historic precedent you see around town and also just makes a little bit more sense in this instance, given that the piazza above is only two bays. Um, the fenestration at the piazza is mostly intact here, but we're requesting to replace the non- and the the rear addition will have vertical slat screening to break up the foundation and provide access under the house. Light slide. So here's our streetscape again, showing number eight at its existing height, but with the dashed line indicating the proposed height after elevation. And that is all I have. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Cool. Uh, questions? No? Uh, I don't think there's any public comment, um, staff comments. Yeah, the proposal is appropriate and meets requirements set by the BAR. I think it actually improves the, the design of the house. Staff's recommending uh, final approval pending new firm adoption on January 29th, 2021. Okay, any board discussion or a motion? Um, I, I'm in favor of Staff's recommendation for approval. Okay. Um, second by. Make a motion. Yep. Glenn's made a motion for final approval. Go ahead. Second. 
Did you make the motion, Glenn? I did, yeah. Sorry, I oh, think the audio okay. is still bad. Sorry. I think. Yeah. Okay. So Glenn made a motion for final approval pending new firm adoption on January 29th, 2021. Uh, Fillmore seconded it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? None. Ayes have it. Okay. Thank that you. That concludes our meeting. And then, all right, Kim, are the board members remaining online? Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, well, I just wanted to chat about terms. So um, again, I want to reiterate um, the fact that I will be touching base with all of you guys soon to talk about um, your term and your service with the city. And I know Julia, we're trying to catch up sometime maybe over the weekend or next week. Sure. Um, Glenn, I need to reach out to you and Phil Moore too. Um, I know Jay's touched base with me. Let me know his plans. Yeah, I guess are you turning it over to me, Kim? So guys, I want to let y'all know. I, I didn't even realize our terms were up, but when Kim let me know, uh, I, I was thinking and to cut to the chase, I, I told her that I would at the end of our term in December that I'd prefer to uh, not re-up and let my term expire. Uh, and my reasoning being, um, just like I didn't realize my term was getting up, I started uh, going through this process with, with my kids um, recently, and my daughter's going to college in a year and a half, uh, and my son will be going in four and a half years, and I just started counting all the Thursday nights I would prefer to be with them, um, given I only have a finite number of Thursday nights left with them. And uh, I decided I, I think I needed for my, my kids to, to do that. Um, so it was, it was very much, uh, you know, putting my kids first kind of decision. Um, and I went on when I told Kim, and I'll, I'll tell you all how, how it was a tough decision for me. I, I really have enjoyed all of this. Um, I'm, I'm the sort of the least qualified out of anybody here, but I've, I've, I've learned so much and I can't look at buildings the same anymore and it's like my curse you know but um <laughs> it, uh, and, I, and that's something I've, that i've carried with um and i i've learned it all from from y'all and um and that's that's something i'll stay with me forever so i um i really enjoyed it um who, who knows maybe i come back for another lap you know after my kids get out but that's that's what i'm gonna do um and so i guess i have a few meetings left this year in 2020 and then um and that's it. And I also told Kim, I, I'm, I'm glad to try to help, you know, find another me um, and uh, mentor or whatever I got to do. But, um, but, but that's what I was telling Kim this week. Thanks, Jay. I totally get your perspective, but um, man, you've been really good and it's been a pleasure to be shepherded by you. It's been fun. Uh, I agree. And, and Jay, I think, I think it's been really good to have somebody, I mean, frankly, who who came on board without the terminology and without the the background and and to um, a to see you pick it up and actually you know I believe you care about it but b I think to have you lead the meetings um, from a non-design background standpoint you know with with the legal end of it and kind of keeping things between the lines and on track. Um, I think has really been fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree with with Glenn and Julia. I mean, you've just done a, a first class job of uh, of keeping us in order. 
And okay. so um, I appreciate that. Thank you. And we obviously and agree. Um, but I wanted to try to get together for a happy hour before the year's over. So I don't know if you know, all the rest of my board meeting evenings are free. So if, if you guys want to pick one of those Thursday nights, um, maybe we'll look at some of the agendas and see what, what we, we have a light agenda so we can. Or if you don't even want to, if you want to Zoom, maybe Zoom happy hour. After we can just drink right now. <laughs> I already am. <laughs> I, I, yeah. That'd be awesome. I, I for one, would, would love to get a drink with you guys. And it's something, something I've, I've wanted to do for years. So um, if I'm the, the reason, then that's great. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely figure that out. Cool. We'll, and, we'll and thank y'all. If that's if that if y'all like the style or the 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 way to the way I try to run a meeting, then I, that's the first thing I would tell whoever you know comes behind me is that's the way you're supposed to do it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it'd be awesome if you could help find someone and or just you know kind of orient a new person. That'd be really helpful, I think. Okay. Now, Kim, I'm, I, I got a I got a thought in mind. I'll I'll get Great. with you. Um, and, I, and I'm not going anywhere, you know, in terms of the background, but thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, from when after we lost Richard and I chaired for a while, it, it was remarkably difficult, especially because, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there. Both. With, yeah, with, with, you, you can't you know, do both. <clears throat> Me, right, meaning right. like put your mind in the project and then keep an eye on what the hell's going on out there. It's tough. Yeah, that was difficult. So I have a whole appreciation for it that I had no idea of. And, and, it, and my take on it is, um, you know, given, given the lack of like technical knowledge that, that I have, like who am I to sit around and tell an applicant what to do with the, you know, with the cornice detail or whatever. I mean, you know, you know more, more than most of the applicants. So that's <laughs> just get out of the way and let y'all do some pretty good stuff. So that's been my approach. Thank you. All right, great. Well, Jay, thanks again for your service, but you know, you do have what two meetings left, so you're not. What do, is that it? We got one in November and one in November and one in December. Is it only one per month? No, I think there's two in November. Oh, really? It's just like a weird date. Uh, right before Thanksgiving, yeah, maybe? Like on Probably on, on Tuesday. Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Uh, Thanksgiving. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Kim, I'll, you and I can email, and I, I have a pretty busy next week and a half with a couple of projects. I'm just back and forth to Edisto and Kiowa a lot. So maybe you and I just hop on Zoom one day instead of in person. Sounds good. Uh, so, Okay. All right, guys. Thanks, y'all. Have, Have a good, good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.